Oh my god, yeah. the arguments are so bad, right? Like, so at one point, one of the students is like, "Only fanatics are against abortion." He goes, "Oh, is Mother Teresa a fanatic?" And we're yes. like, "Of yeah. course, Don't it's absolutely." So he's like, Mother "What Teresa. about the Dalai Lama?" It's like he's the fucking Dalai Lama. Man. <laughs> he's the definite. You mean the guy who wears his ceremonial robe, who was chosen at birth because he has the Buddha's soul within his eyes? <laughs> <laughs> that guy? Yeah, I'd say he's what? super into his thing, man. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because courts can apparently order you to do that. I'm your host, No Illusions, and sitting 700 miles to my immediate left is my good friend Heath Enright. Heath, welcome back. Thanks, Noah. Pass, by the way. Okay. This, yeah, this no, movie does not get, get intro it. jokes. <laughs> Fuck that. That's fair. That's fair. A lot to get to. And sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I'm amazing, Noah. Are you really? I've broken our lawyer. And he <laughs> shall never <laughs> return from whence he came. All right. And speaking of that, yeah, exactly. Also joining us this week is our special guest masochist. You'll know him from the opening arguments podcast. He is Andrew Torres. Andrew, welcome back. Yeah, I, I thought I was going to be mad when last week you had Thomas on and demoted me from, you know, co-host to, I don't know, interview <laughs> subject on my own fucking show. Uh, I've long, I've all forgotten that. I am just, I, I'm at, I'm at a, a 11 out of 10 on rage and I'm never coming back. Yeah, no, that's, that was the whole point of this movie was to distract you. Uh, it Do you introduce Thomas or does Thomas introduce you? How does it work on that show? Andrew, the other guy on the show is the talent. Okay. Like it's the host and the talent. That's the other role. Okay. I just, you know, I, I made Thomas think I was giving him something. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So, <laughs> so tell us, Heath, other than Andrew's ego, what will we be breaking down today? <laughs> we watched Roe v. Wade. Oh. It's the story of a Christian movie not realizing they can't win in the end when they're doing the story of Roe v. Wade. Oh, yeah, yeah. until we get Roe v. Wade 2 in 2023. Yeah. No, just, Don't no. do that. Yeah, no, it was it was such a weird, like, schadenfreude in advance kind of a feeling throughout the movie. Yeah, <laughs> It ends and they try. It's the best. Yep. We'll get yeah, to they it. Do. Yep. <laughs> but, 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 and another thing, and Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love anti-abortion propaganda, but you miss the sportsmanship and grace of LeBron James, you will love <laughs> this movie. It's the sun was in my theocracy, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and Andrew, obviously, at, at its heart, at least, this is a courtroom drama. And we'll obviously get to all the legal shit they fucked up along the way. But is there like one most egregious fuck up that stands out to you? Uh, let's see. All of the legal stuff is in an infinite way tie for courts don't work that way. <laughs> but what's super weird is that the movie apparently doesn't seem to know how to count. Right. To three. Yes. Like, I did, <laughs> like it shows us two other judges sitting on the bench and then says, eh, winky lady judge just made stuff happen. Am I right? Yeah. And then, and then it does the same thing later with the Supreme Court. I, it's, I, it is baffling to me so yeah uh, numbers yeah yeah no i like we, we brought you on for your legal skills but also basic math i didn't yeah. know when we set out that we were going <laughs> to need your basic math as well all right so speaking of which is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at i would noah i would best worst constitutional law class <laughs> Oh, <laughs> whatever so, could you mean <laughs> uh yeah first of all Joey Lawrence is yes. a professor of law. Yes. Go fuck yourself. It took me out of the movie the whole time. I was like, Joey Lawrence is trying to tell me about constitutional law right now. But I've been in a bunch of constitutional law classes. Andrew, I imagine you've been in a bunch of con, probably more than me. A few, yeah. A bunch of con law classes. Do they ever, is, is there one unit, like, is there an entire semester that you've ever had where the students say why they think abortion is cool and the professor is like, baby killer. Over and over for a semester. <laughs> well, spoiler, 
that's not a con law class. <laughs> we'll get there. But no, the let's go around the room and be outraged by stuff <laughs> is, is not a key part of the legal That's not curriculum. a unit they have? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, never, I never had that unit, but, you know, uh, my uh, education wasn't as complete. Okay. You know the bag of rice scene in It Man? What if he had lost <laughs> all of those people? That's the, that's the classroom scene we get oh, God. in this movie. Oh, so speaking of Joey Lawrence, I was going to go with best, worst, gam, who's who. Yeah. <laughs> right? So in addition to Joey, we get John Voight, Corbin Burnson, John Schneider, the pockmarky brother from the Goonies. We do. Like the only people missing are Kevin Sorbo and Stephen Baldwin. And from what I read, they were originally cast as Supreme Court justices before they decided that this movie Sorry. was too Sorry. one-sided for them. Stephen Baldwin was going to be <laughs> yes. Wait, wait. K, K Sorbs? K, they had to have. Okay, so I, I guess K Sorbs would have been Wizard White, but uh, wow. Uh. <laughs> Kevin Sorbo's like, look, I'll get hit with a car at the end of God's Not Dead and convert to Christianity at the last second to please an audience, but this movie's bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, because, like, honestly, I, I think it's because they looked at it and said, you know, look, I still have at least a snowball's chance in hell of being in a Hollywood movie, so no. <laughs> <laughs> and see, I was going to go with Best Worst Gam Who's Not. <laughs> this movie has cameos by Tommy Laren. Mike Lindell, <laughs> Roger Stone, and my favorite and the use of 23-point font in my notes, yep. ex-gay hebophile, Milo Yiannopoulos. Hebophile? <laughs> oh, my God. And the acting in this movie is so bad that you just don't even notice when he is not in these non you, know, you, you notice Roger Stone. Well, that, that knows that. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom Mueller. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and by the way, according to those same media reports that I was reading about K. Sorbs and Stephen Baldwin, apparently an Anthony Scaramucci cameo was planned, but then he oh. became persona non grata in the GOP. <laughs> so. Oh. Uh, well, my best worst is best worst Ferris Bueller impersonation. <laughs> so, look, I, I don't want to spoil this cinematographic masterpiece, but the voiceover protagonist is basically like if Deadpool was fascinated by the protocols of the Elders of Zion instead of Spider-Man. Okay? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's bad. It's real bad. And it's so verbose. I've never met a more verbose voiceover. <laughs> and constantly reminding you that like, oh, and I was lying about that too uh, you can trust me now as the narrator for this movie <laughs> right but literally everything i said up until 17 seconds ago was total bullshit <laughs> yeah exactly uh, counting that the <laughs> actors in the movie have to wait for the voiceover to finish multiple times oh, you yeah. see them being like <laughs> boom <laughs> yeah well because the goddamn writer director star realized there were scenes he wasn't in and he's like i'd like my voice in a few of those so <laughs> All right, well, it's going to take a lot to revisit this entire fucking movie, so we're going to need a minute, but we'll be back in a flash with all the voiceover telling you what you just saw that is Roe v. Wade. Hi, podcast listener. I'm Eli Bosnick. And I'm your excuses for not going to therapy. Uh, And I'm here to tell you about BetterHelp. BetterHelp, what's that? Uh, well, BetterHelp provides professional counseling done securely online. Professional counseling? You don't need that. You just need some fresh air. You're fine. I mean, fine. May maybe, but you also might not be fine. And that's when talking to a mental health care professional can be really important. Well, I, I bet BetterHelp doesn't have the right counselor for you, though. Just It just means like, they, they probably just have ones that hate you. Actually, BetterHelp has a broad range of expertise available, which may or may not be locally available in many areas. So if you need a counselor who's secular or trans affirming or sex work positive, they can provide that. Well, still, if, if you don't like them, I bet you're stuck with them forever, like legally or something. Uh, no, BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change your counselor if needed. Oh, wow. That's that's really great. But still, you can't afford therapy. I bet that costs like a million, jillion dollars or something. Would be. Actually, BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. 
Visit BetterHelp.com slash awful. That's better H-E-L-P. And join over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. And God Awful Movies listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash awful. Oh, I, um, I guess I gotta go. Huh. Looks like I'm out of excuses. What about you? Andrew! Andrew, thanks for coming. Yeah, man, I appreciate you hopping on for this review. Yeah, no, no problem, guys. Happy to be here. Yeah, I think you're really going to contribute a bunch of really important information. Y- yeah, look, the actual history about Roe v. Wade is seriously fascinating. And needless to say, uh, this well, movie... Right, well, no, no, no. but not, not about the court stuff. Yeah. Wait, wait, what? No? I mean, I, I guess you can talk about that a little bit, too. I was wondering if you could help us more with our side of the script. Yeah. Your side of the script. Yeah, like when we're doing the review, can I say why hasn't Jamie Kennedy killed himself yet? Yeah, <sighs> I mean, you know that it's that's that's not nice, but legally you can say that. Cool, cool, cool. Good to know. So, uh, follow up. Can I say seriously, Jamie Kennedy? We know you're listening. Your life peaked at the movie Scream. If you kill yourself and mention this podcast in your note, everyone will be sorry. Oh, that's good. That, yeah. The, yeah. The, uh, the more specific you get, the, the less comfortable okay, I am. Okay, okay, wait. I could be vague. Get in that. How about this? Can I send Nick Lowe a, a bottle of bleach with a note that says, if you drink this on Facebook Live, you might be remembered for something other than suing to get your comeback from Sophia Vergara? Uh, yeah. no, Noah, really? Like, I... No, you definitely can't do that. I one. didn't think And I'm so, a little bit disappointed that I, I've got to tell you. It's the mailing, right? The one. mailing is the and problem. Right, across no, state lines. Lots of, state lots lines, of yeah. things are the That's problem. The legal thing. Okay. Well, then I have a bunch of notes I need to rewrite for the review then. Yeah, me too. I'll tell Lucinda to cancel the uh, package pickup. Mm-hmm. Yes. Related uh, to that. Oh, okay. <sighs> <laughs> And we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to start off in 1985 with our protagonist, Abortion Man, getting interviewed by the Washington Post. Eventually, (laughs) he'll get a name, and it'll be Bernie, but I have him as Abortion Man through most of my notes. (laughs) And this interview's insane. The interviewer's like, so, when you murder a baby, is it it cool? Like, do you like it? (laughs) He's like, yeah, man, I'm a huge fan. I love, what the fuck are you talking about? Yep. He's like, does it bother you? He's like, nope, does not bother me. Lifeless tissue. Fuck that little bastard. Well, but really? Yeah, right, right. He pulls up. But have you ever thought about it like, nah, though? And he's like, oh, fuck, nah, though. Wow. <laughs> Shit. This is a moral fucking dilemma now. <laughs> and to prove how stupid this movie is, this interview is supposed to take place post his conversion to pro-life baby saver. Yeah. yeah. So he forgot for a second that he's pro-life baby saving and then the guy was like, really? I thought you were in a different point in the timeline at this point in the movie and Nick Loeb's like, shit, right, I'm in a different point in the timeline. They, yeah. but they, they add the fucking subtitles in post. I don't know what year it is. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where we should point out that this entire movie will be based on Dr. Bernard Nathanson's book, Aborting America, which he wrote after converting to Catholicism and becoming anti-choice. Yeah. It is filled with a series of demonstrable lies, many of which will be repeated in this movie. But the voice of this movie, before we get started, let's just point out, the voice of this movie is a guy who says, I was a professional liar and self-aware murderer of babies, but now I am a moral authority. Yes, but now... Our <laughs> protagonist. You yeah. could totally... Yeah. So now we we get that voiceover, right? This voiceover kicks in. It will irritate us throughout this movie. But it starts off with uh, all them damn feminists in the damn 70s. Yeah. To be clear, this movie's position is that the women's liberation movement of the 1970s was too far. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, we're at scene two. It's thirty eight seconds in, and I'm out. Right, like it. it, it <laughs> yeah. Because because again, remember, like the message that the evil people who wrote and produced and made this movie want to tell you is like, ah, oh, Roe v. Wade was just like like the court was kind of you know puff puff at the time, if you know what I mean. Like, it was the seventies. <laughs> who knows what the like? We were all wearing bell bottoms. It was crazy. Like it's just, <laughs> instead of you know. 
Roe v. Wade was a relatively uncontroversial standard application of conventional jurisprudence at the time. Seven to. Uh, all right. Yeah. Well, and so he's telling us that it was all those damn women in the 70s. And then we're seeing this weird ass footage. We've got women marching for their rights with ominous music behind it that's completely out of place and then there's like a voiceover in the background who's basically telling us that at the end of the shift abortion doctors all have to juggle the fetuses and whoever <laughs> drops first has to eat theirs it's yeah <laughs> okay sorry i know like no was exaggerating maybe a little bit but i think literally this was said by the vo at one point 12 year olds get abortions in public schools. Yes. That's happening. <laughs> yeah. Uh, followed by they put the baby on yes! the table yes! and they ask the parents whether they want it to live or die. Yes. <laughs> I mean, so my takeaway was better funding for public schools then. Like, is that <laughs> the argument being made? Yeah. I don't know about your guys' school nurse, but she would just give you two aspirin and let you lie down in the back for a little while. <laughs> And then, okay, so, and then on the assurance that they are not lying, this is based on true shit, we rewind the clock to 1949. If you're doing the math at home, yes, that is three minutes into the movie, flashing back now to three different goddamn decades. <laughs> <laughs> this is the chess wisdom scene. Oh, okay, oh. wisdom, though? <laughs> Would you say wisdom? Oh. Okay, so, all right, I looked at this chess board. The <laughs> white side has two white bishops. Oh, nice. Sure. And that, I mean, okay, maybe maybe that is, like, that's advanced. Maybe right. that is white wisdom. Like, I could see that yeah, being right? helpful. Yeah, exactly. yeah, that's when you get kinged. It's really a big deal. <laughs> He's playing chess against his dad, and when I say the protagonist is playing chess against his dad. I do not mean that he's eight, right? He's 25, right? Mm -hmm. And does not realize that it's a bad idea to move your queen one square diagonally away from a pawn. Yeah. <laughs> is this his first game of chess? Like, maybe start with hungry, hungry hippos, okay? <laughs> okay, but, Andrew, uh, abortion. So, yeah. maybe right. you should. Uh, <laughs> so... Yeah. So and then we cut. For, so he like, you know, he's trying to outwit his dad, but his dad is using chess to teach him an important life lesson. And of course, dad ultimately wins. And then we cut to abortion man and his first love. She's like pregnant, apparently, but they get into the scene in the weirdest possible way because we see the checkmate and then we immediately cut to her looking at him going, how could I have been so stupid? And it's just yes. like, <laughs> did you make a bad chess move? <laughs> she's <laughs> mad. She's dating a guy who would fall for a corner. Mate. Yeah. I get it. We've all been there. This seemed like a perfectly reasonable reaction. Yeah, to me. well, really, it was a pretty dumb move. But she needs an abortion. If only abortion man was nearby. Right. <laughs> Also, whatever tech they use to young up Nick Loeb's oh. face for this scene, <laughs> oh. they should get a refund yeah. and yeah. some kind of like medical malpractice lawsuit. And hate crime notification. Right? Yeah. Like, look, look, the side <laughs> shots of Nick Loeb here are like two thirds of the way to see Thomas Howell in Soul Man. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like it is, it's real. Like this would, yeah. this would not get you elected governor of Virginia today. Okay. <laughs> I feel like they like hacked into the computers they used for that Will Smith versus Will will smith movie and they were like damn we can still use this right yeah right. Be fine. <laughs> oh <sighs> jesus christ so yeah and and then so but what happens in the story is he sends this woman that he loves off to get an abortion like a back alley abortion and then she dies but the movie is coy about whether or not she like right like he picks her up and she's all bloody and he's like and that was the last time i ever wanted that to happen like what to happen guys are we we, you don't want to say dead woman in your movie? Oh, you don't want to. I didn't even catch that she died. I thought it was just like a really weird choice for an acting moment where he's like, okay, so I see you're back from the, the abortion that you got in an alley. I hope it went okay. I'm going to carry you across the threshold into our house. <laughs> in a crazy, crazy physical bit. And we watch this for a second and then the movie's like, yeah, that's weird. That's weird. We better fade out. <laughs> yeah. We're going to fade if out. If only this had been more illegal. Wait, what side are we on, <laughs> yeah. guys? Oh, they do Jesus. Yeah, right. Okay. So, but then we get him graduating from medical school so that we can, you know, gasp, realize that the Hippocratic Oath used to forbid abortion specifically. I, we, <laughs> well, yeah. does it? You know, no, no, thank no, you. It does right, not. Right. <laughs> it says specifically, like, I will never provide a pessary for a, 
a DIY abortion to a woman. Okay, but then maybe give like a real one where you do it. That would be great. A pessary, that's that like feral pig from South America. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck's a pessary? Sorry. Chupacabra. It's like, but yeah, man, like, look, we've updated the Hippocratic Oath several goddamn times now and again, right? Yeah, you. this is 1949. The fact that we used to talk about the abortion Leatherman tool doesn't really apply. <laughs> <sighs> I'll not unbalance a patient's humors. You know, we don't talk about this enough. <laughs> fucking, how are we doing their patient's humors? When bleeding my patient. Yeah, right. So, yeah. But after we get that scene, he's like, but I'll tell you the true story of the legalization of abortion. And then the title falls with all but a goddamn thunderclap, right? <laughs> doom, doom. <laughs> Roe v. Wade. So, we okay, now it's New York City. We're back in 1970. And I look, the movie has not actually said the words abortion was a Jewish plot, but that is precisely what they have spent the last six minutes setting up. Right, and they pull the trigger on it now. That was the working title of the movie, right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they had to change it at the last second because somebody got mad, some producer. But that was what they were doing. Yeah, and the voice acting that will be <clears throat> throughout the rest of the movie will make it clear that the script was not changed before that title was drawn. Uh, no. no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because this is the scene where we meet Jamie Kennedy playing Larry something or another. The Nadler. Yeah, Nadler, and we also meet Betty Friedan, the head woman. At the time, oh. <laughs> the queen of feminism herself. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sorry. This is the only positive thing I'll say in the next like eight hours. But I kind of like the Betty Friedan storms into the men's only club bit. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. This is was, great. Yeah. She walks into this fancy hotel in New York City and they're like men only in the Oak Room. And she's like, yeah, fuck your face. And walks right <laughs> into the Oak Room. And she's supposed to be like a bad character. And yeah. I was so uh, happy about this. Exactly. Uh. Right, that's the problem, is that she, yeah, right, yeah, love this character. Oh, she's evil, right, okay. We as the audience are supposed to be like, she heard the rules, the way it's <laughs> yes, a man only. Right, that's a very long tradition, don't respect <gasps> tradition. I mean, in a society. At all. So, yeah, but so the, the Jewish cabal that wants to legalize abortion so they can drink the blood of the babies meets up with Betty Friedan, and now we're seven minutes in the movie. It's time to smear Margaret Sanger a bit. It's been a while. Uh, okay. Um. If I were designing a movie to piss off Andrew, I would not go as broad with this Margaret Sanger attack. As this they baby literally does. have her giving a speech in front of a burning cross. Uh, it, it, okay. All right. All right. Okay. So a couple of things. First. The only true thing in this entire bit that's coming up is, yes, a white woman in the 1920s used the word Negro. Okay? Yes. So did every other person on Earth, right? Right. She also did, by the way, open up birth control, but not abortion, as this movie will itself concede in an hour from now. Yeah. Yeah. She opened up birth control clinics in poor black areas. But then we see Margaret Sanger... In front of a burning lowercase t, giving a speech that says, you know, the Negro breeding is out of control. It sounds really super bad. And, and you're thinking, did they just make up the speech? No, they did not make up the speech. Really? It, it, no. Real, so real Margaret speech? Sanger, she wanted to collect all the black ova for her necklace collection. <laughs> and that was like a real thing. Well, what they omitted, maybe a slightly salient detail, is that these were not Margaret Sanger's original words. She was, in fact, quoting from W.E.B. Du Bois. <laughs> wow. And possibly, I mean, I guess now they're going to go with plagiarism for Roe v. Wade 2 when they read this. <laughs> <laughs> but look, like, we can't overly apologize for the, like, terrible views that people had in the first half of the 20th century. Margaret Sanger absolutely was steeped in the social Darwinism that, like, was big among the intelligentsia at that time. So was W.B. Du Bois. Anti-abortion liars then put those two things together and say Margaret Sanger was on a secret crusade to euthanize the blacks, as this movie will lie, to reduce their population to zero because she is a racist genocidal monster. It was the exact opposite. Yes. Margaret Sanger worked with civil rights leaders who were concerned as in the W.B. Du Bois quote, and again, like, I don't want to be defending this because I'm not a eugenicist, but his concern was 
white people have access to birth control and are planning the future of their children and we are not. Right. And Margaret Sanger wanted to open up that opportunity. That's why the organization is called Planned Parenthood to <laughs> poor Tracks. and black people because she was incredibly pro equality. It was an unbelievably progressive stance at the time. And now time to open up the second bottle of blood pressure pills. <laughs> All right, so yeah, but we back out of that flashback, that little doodly do, and we're back in this restaurant where Betty eventually agrees to join in the evil Jewish conspiracy along with Larry, abortion man, and chubby lawyer guy <laughs> to legalize abortion and make a fortune. And I want to point out that they can't even make it through the Betty for Dan thing without being like, well, Betty didn't want to join in, but then we told her all the popular feminists were yeah, going right. to be there. Yeah, exactly. yeah, you know, like a woman. <laughs> yeah, he's like, all right, well, if you're not going to do it, we'll get Gloria Steinem and Bella Abzug, your sworn enemies. <laughs> right, <laughs> yes, exactly. Makes no sense. <laughs> so. But they butter her up. They're like, you're the best angry lady, the best. Well, yeah. We want you, yeah. specifically. Yeah, but so after they've sufficiently mansplained it, Betty joins their efforts, and we cut to the first conference for the National Association to Repeal Abortion Laws. And we start what will become a running theme of this movie, which is that virtually all the walk and talks in these people's lives take place in some kind of room or street full of screaming, chanting people, <laughs> yeah. which makes really little sense when you consider that this is supposed to be a NARAL meeting. So they're protesting themselves. Yeah, their right. NARAL meeting. <laughs> Do we all just want to get up and shout with our signs to before we start? Yeah, rabble, 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 rabble. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. But they're rabbling specifically for abortion on demand, right? Like HBO on demand. Remember that? Just like yeah. with that with abortion. Amazon Premium. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch Godzilla fight King Kong and I want to kill my baby. <laughs> And Bernie's going like, but but we shouldn't have abortion on demand. Can't we just legalize it in cases of rape and, and a threat to the women's health? And Larry's like, no, more dead babies for our Jewish rituals. <laughs> the money, baby, the money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, OK, so then we got to Bernie sitting at home. He's watching the shitty ass little TVs they had back when America was great, oh. I guess. And this is where we first meet his wife. His his wife with was Bernie married to Jacqueline Smith in 1973. <laughs> yes, I mean, was. his wife is an eleven. I mean, like yes. wow, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, kind of made you want to go out and abort a few babies. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> forget forget the money, but you know, if it, the brunette from Charlie's Angels, I'm all over that. <laughs> yeah, and she asked him like one question, just kind of like a little skeptical about his project, and he's like, "You're being a cunt about my awesome feminist thing." <laughs> Get out of here. Yes. The men in this movie are just. Awful at all moments. Yeah. So bad. Well, oh, I guess yeah. not outside of this movie, too. Yeah. Is yeah. yeah. <laughs> True. All right. So, but then on the news, we, <laughs> this is so great. On the news, we see that New York passed a law legalizing abortion, but only after some confusing vote changey shit that they don't explain, but make sound really sinister. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. I looked up this vote changey thing because, of course, I did. Right. Here's what really happens. All right. This guy, Earl Bridges, was the Republican majority leader in the New York Senate. And he was basically, and there was scheduled, introduced by Democrats, a uh, a resolution to repeal the state's restrictions on abortions. And he was going to like Mitch McConnell, that thing, right? But then he decided, no, 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 better than that. Let's let it come to a vote. It'll lose. And I can fundraise off of this, right? Mm -hmm. So he changes the vote. And his strategy was, right, because unlike Mitch McConnell, he was not good at his job. Mm -hmm. His strategy was, well, I'm pretty sure the other Catholic Democrats here are going to vote with us. And if we have the version that comes up for a vote be the one without the amendments in it, right, without any restrictions, push comes to shove, they'll vote no. Spoiler, they voted yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. The movie, I'll let you describe how the movie has Earl Bridges respond to this. The New York Times report that he sat in his chair and cried. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, that's it. Oh, good. Good. His mom comes over with orange slices. Earl. <laughs> Earl. Well, in the movie, he cries. Mm -hmm. But, um... <laughs> 
So this is a this is a congressman. This is a New York State congressman, right? Mm -hmm. And that happens, and then he's like, "I would like to read." A fetus poem. I'm a congressman. <laughs> I have an anti-abortion one-man show I would like to perform. And he does that forever. We watch this forever. Two full minutes. As far as I can tell, not a real thing. Not I Now, why they thought this would make him look better than <laughs> crying because his strategy lost, I don't know. But uh, not a real thing. No. no. To be clear, this, this poem, one-man show, uh -huh. is... First person from the perspective of a fetus, yep. right? That's what mm -hmm. he's doing. Yep. And I was like, oh my God, he's fucking doing this. I honestly thought he was going to like start screaming and miming a fetus getting aborted at this podium. <laughs> oh, oh, my head's getting a squish now. Someone, someone brings <laughs> over like a giant cardboard tube. <laughs> Seriously, that was not out of the question. And he walked right up to that line oh, in the movie. The, the last line of his little fucking blastocyst poem was, today my mommy killed me. <laughs> today? Literally. Also, this actor... He obviously got himself crying at like second, third line of this monologue, yes, yes. which has seven more minutes. So <laughs> by the seventh minute, he's like, eh, ah, eh. <laughs> <laughs> also nothing to incite my sympathy more than a 60 plus year old white man flanked by two other 60 plus year old white men crying about a baby that doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right. So now it's time to meet Dr. Mildred Jefferson, the first black woman to graduate from Harvard Medical School. And uh, according to this movie, anyway, at least very anti-abortion. Oh, my God. <laughs> also known as Stacey Dash's Thank, afterlife yes. punishment. <laughs> yeah, this is Stacey uh, Dash from Clue. Stacey Apparently Dash. she's garbage politically. She's yeah. Oh, worse, yeah. Just like Kelsey Grammer. Yeah. She's been auditioning to be Candace Owens stunt double for the last <laughs> few years. <laughs> And look, she's a terrible person with terrible ideas, but I would not wish this movie or this part on her uh. in a million fucking year. If I were some part of intergalactic court and they were like, would you like Stacey Dash to have to play the part and say the thing she does in this movie? I'd be like, nah, man, can't we just go with like fire lizards or something? That seems a <laughs> yeah. little much. Honestly, this movie was so shitty it made me feel sympathetic for Stacey Dash, who's the fucking worst, because <sighs> they make her say all these ridiculous, horribly racist things. She's pretty much the only person of color in the movie it's so bad yeah so she's meeting with a priest and a, a woman who has an anti-woman's rights organization i guess <laughs> i run a pro-life women's group we mostly don't do things <laughs> <laughs> yeah and they have this bizarre conversation that manages to be so racist and so sexist and so unaware of those two facts yeah <laughs> There is there is a literal so the priest here who uh, you know I just have as Cardinal Biggles throughout the rest of my notes, right? <laughs> but he says like, well, you're not at all like Rosa Parks. Like, yes. I just are, are you fucking kidding me? Like, <laughs> and again, Stacy Dash does not turn around and punch him in the dick. Like, I I I dare you to try that to any. Please look. Please do not take this advice from this podcast, okay? <laughs> and by the way, so I have to point out the three people on screen now are such terrible actors that for most of the rest of the time, they're going to be when they're on screen together, they'll be with Joey Lawrence and he will <laughs> outshine them like the goddamn sun next to a candle. Absolutely. That's how they are. So <laughs> fucking bad. Yeah, you can almost see the like stage hands holding up the signs that say, please do not look directly into the camera when you're not speaking. <laughs> yes. and please no. stop reading this out loud. Don't move your Stop. lips while you read this sign. <laughs> yeah. The problem was a bunch of those stagehands quit in the middle of a shot. Yeah. So they did do that. <laughs> That's a true story about the production of this movie. Is it because we said you're no Rosa Parks when we liked you? Yeah. <laughs> That one, that one definitely had walkouts. Apparently, they had walkouts constantly <laughs> yeah. in the Constant middle of scenes. Constant walkouts during yeah. this production. Well, so literally day one, this movie lost its director and its assistant director. <laughs> Both of them left on the first day. So the writer and producer had to step in who had neither of them any directing experience whatsoever and had to do this. And nobody wanted to help, right? Even the, even the people who stayed were just like, man, no, you tell me how you want the fucking shot set up. 
That's your job, motherfucker. I ain't going to do it for you. <laughs> oh, no. This is a union gig, so I can't walk off unless you don't give me my 15-minute lunch break. But I sure as fuck am not going to assistant direct you, sir. <laughs> no. So, okay. So, Dr. Mildred heads off. She doesn't like the Rosa Parks line. But the priest follows her down into the subway. And she gives this ama- the, the amazing delivery of her, I do what I do on principle, like Don Quixote. That line. Oh, I, I, that, so, <laughs> wow. All right. You really? You want to be Don Quixote yeah. in this scenario? Against all odds, I, I have, in fact, learned something from this movie. And that fact is, I've learned that Stacey Dash has definitely not read Don Quixote. No, no, no one Nick involved Lowe. with this yes. movie has read Don Quixote. <laughs> Don Quixote is about a mentally ill person who nobody helps, and then he runs his horse into a windmill and dies. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but to be fair, if someone were to put a gun to my head and be like, describe this movie, running your horse into a windmill <laughs> and dying <laughs> is pretty good. Uh. Or Stacey she dashes career really yeah okay so <laughs> but then then the priest tries to do the first they came poem but he intentionally <gasps> gets it wrong because you can't open with socialists when your audience would be like that'd be awesome if somebody came for the socialists and the trade unionists <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> and then because this movie has no fucking self-awareness This actor, who again is not this character, he's a real person who got to vote in the last election, looks at Stacey Dash, who did not get to punch or pepper spray him and go, you know, this is just like slavery. Yep. Yeah. The white character said to the black character. And Stacey Dash goes, are you bringing that up because I'm black? And he's like, (laughs) yes. Yep. Because you're black. (laughs) Well. Yeah, and now it's time for us to meet Robert Byrne, played by <laughs> the incomparable Joey Lawrence. Whoa! Okay, <laughs> this movie contains Jamie Kennedy basically rubbing his hands together with fetus blood while doing Jew voice, but I would argue no historical figure is worse served in this movie than poor Robert fucking Byrne. <laughs> Or maybe Malcolm X, because Joey Lawrence is dressed like white Malcolm X. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it's ridiculous. All I know is I watched that James Bond movie where they had Denise Richards play the nuclear physicist. (laughs) You remember that? She was Dr. Christmas Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this was way less believable (laughs) casting. That's all I have to say. We're going to talk about this Denise Richards thing later. Let me tell you something about the fucking Constitution, bro. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so he shows up immediately. The very first thing this character does is gives that dumbass uh, out of context, any society willing to give up liberty quote from Benjamin Franklin. Every time, every time Joey Lawrence walks onto the screen, he will give an inapposite quote. Like I, and, and I just, I need to know if this is in the script, right? If it's the writers who thought, Oh, well, you know, brilliant law professors walk around and all they do is quote other people. Or if this was <laughs> a Joey, a Joey Lawrence internal note of like, Hey, let's, uh, let's punch up the script a little bit. I feel like my guy should be quoting somebody famous here. He would be, uh, he'd be quoting these awesome memes that I saw on this right wing. Facebook page before they took it down. Oh, God. Yeah. No, but so, but they're strategizing against how to fight abortion. And what's amazing here is they keep talking, they're talking about Dr. Nathanson, abortion man. And they're saying, like, they call him the abortion king. <laughs> oh, if they had, if they had flash cut to his commercial, right? Where he's like, come on down to Dr. Bernard Nathanson's house of abortion. I am slashing prices. I'm going crazy. <sighs> And they end this scene. It's just a tiny thing, but I loved it so much. They end the scene in the most awkward way. They turn to Stacey Dash and they're like, hey, do you have any children, Dr. Mildredson? And she's like, no. And then there's this pause where they're just like, why would that be the last line of the scene? What what, what in the world? And then it just fades out. Yep. And then it fades out. Yep. I, I, so, <laughs> it's so awkward. I thought her line must be like, Someone aborted them when I wasn't looking. Like, that is the only <laughs> dramatic resonance that could be in this movie. Um, no, we just fade from that. Then we cut to that phenomenal waste of prime real estate that is St. Patrick's Cathedral. Jesus Christ, I cannot look at that thing without trying to summon up a giant marshmallow kaiju, right? <laughs> okay, so since they have placed this now in a specific diocese, 
let's just remind everyone that the good guys for the rest mm-hmm. of this movie, mm-hmm. we now know that during this time period, the 1970s, the Diocese of St. Patrick's was actively covering up the rape and torture of hundreds of children. Yes. So mm-hmm. that's the protagonist. Every time you see this priest in the rest of the movie, keep in mind he is either fucking a kid or covering up kid fucking. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And so we see them and then Bernie's VO cuts in at this point and he says, now we were all a bunch of prejudiced motherfuckers, us pro-abortionists, and we hated the fucking Catholics. I, it, <laughs> and then the dialogue goes to, you know, this this plucky pro-life group who was sort of our stand-in protagonist here saying, yeah, it, it was just crazy. You know, how unfair is it to imply that, you know, it's, it's the Catholics who are behind the anti-abortion movement. Now, to plan our anti-abortion movement, why don't we go in this giant... Catholic Church. Yes. Um, we can meet with this Catholic priest yes. who's going to head up our organization. I, and by the way, I'm a Catholic fucking lawyer. Uh, <laughs> he even says, he goes like, uh, look at this in the newspaper. Whenever they talk to, about me, it's Catholic uh, lawyer so-and-so. You never see him identifying Jewish people like that, do you? I'm like, don't, don't you though? <laughs> no matter how many times I write letters and ask them to put it in brackets around their names so that I know. I just to stop like, reading. Right. <laughs> I was like three parentheses at the beginning would just set it off for us. Yes. <laughs> oh my Didn't God. this movie just introduce Dr. Mildred as the first black woman to graduate from X? I mean, <laughs> doesn't this script use the phrase, oh, Jews, more than the Quran? <laughs> <laughs> oh. There's also. This fantastic anti-religion moment by accident where he's like, we need action. And the priest is like, we're praying as hard as we can. And they're like, come on. Yeah, that man. doesn't we mean you, like you real know, stuff. Don't make us say it. <laughs> <laughs> he pulls a Jew gold bar with a swastika on it from behind the altar. Oh, oh you mean this stuff? Are we supposed to do so, this <laughs> and then I, I love this too because they're having this conversation. The, the, the fucking priest has this little melodramatic Oscar moment where he goes, where are all the little abortion headstones? Where are all the little abortion graves? Um, well, <laughs> Texas, Italy, yeah. in reality, dollhouse yards, yeah, right. maybe. Yes. I don't know what people do, but there's a bunch of them. And then Dr. Mildred cuts in and she goes, well, and one thing I can say for certain, as a physician, I would know is that life begins at conception. And I'm like, what insight would being a physician give you on that? <laughs> and Cardinal Biggles looks over and says, yeah, your your dad was a uh, is a minister. Right. And and I just want everybody to understand for, for proper context. In the 1970s, that is not how that exchange would no. have gone down, right? Stacy's dad would have been calling them like blood drinking papists, right? <laughs> yes. And the priest would be yelling about how they, you know, desiccated the Virgin Mary. Like, I, <laughs> uh, right, right. They fought wars over that whole Protestant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they yeah. were not big fans of each other. No. So and then they they're talking about she's like, you know, but I know that life begins at conception. And then they're like, so does Dr. Nathanson. She's like, who's that? And he's like, they call him the scraper. And I'm like, in the last fucking scene, they called him the abortion king. Pick a fucking <laughs> nickname and stick to it, guys. The scraper king. <laughs> oh, damn. Scrapist was right there. We should have used scraper. Oh, Is it too late? Can we take so, it? No, she's already gone. That was the 70. God damn it. <laughs> and then again, because apparently Dr. Mildred's whole thing is to end the scenes in weird non sequiturs. She says at the end of this scene, she says, you know, it's cheaper to abort a baby than it is to keep it on welfare. And they're like, who are you talking to? <laughs> at this point, my only working theory is that Stacey Dash had a Heath and I S game where she was like, I get a dollar for every time my line is last in the scene. So she would just ad lib <laughs> some right wing talking point in the hope that Nick Loeb kept it. All right. So now it's time for Eli's favorite cameo, right? So Bertie's with his wife wrestling with the thought of opening his own baby murder clinic. But his his wife doesn't want him to murder babies. And he's like, here's how much money I would make. And he, she's like, oh, well, <laughs> murder some fucking babies. Then. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I didn't realize. And this, again, does cue my favorite scene. So first of all, before we even get to what happens, the music for this scene is <laughs> Abortion <laughs> Factory, a city on the move. It's so good. It's like <laughs> Lucy and Ethel eating fetuses off the end of the conveyor belt that's going too fast. It's so ridiculous. Yeah, right. So he's going to London to learn how to be a super abortionist. Oh, you know, he's, God. He climbs to the top of a mountain. 
<laughs> and that's uh, where he meets Milo Yiannopoulos. <laughs> Dr. Milo Yiannopoulos. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Milo Yiannopoulos channeling Neil Patrick Harris's Nazi doctor from Starship Troopers oh. yep, up, about <laughs> to burst into song. Right? Like, I mean, it, it, he oh. might as well be eating a ham sandwich with one hand and aborting fetuses with the other. The uh. whole time, his abortion sucking machine is making that still sucking on the straw even though there's no more soda in there sound. Uh, it's so good. Come on, if the camera had panned over to a guy drinking a big gulp and Milo was like, stop it! Anyways, <laughs> it's my favorite movie. Oh, Jesus Christ. This scene was amazing. He's listing the specs on this, like, yeah, uh-huh. an industrial revolution abortion machine <laughs> they invented, <laughs> talking about horsepower and torque. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> he might as well slap the top and be like, you can fit 20 million dead babies in here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. So then, oh, God. Then, okay, so we cut from there over to the Planned Parenthood headquarters in New York City with the actual words. Here are the words we open this scene on. Dr. Abortion is, is standing before a, another large group of doctors, and, he's, and he says, the fetus is then quartered. <laughs> yep. And then you draw and quarter the fetus by uh, using four little seahorses. Little seahorses. And- <laughs> We smoosh the baby. We, we punch it in the balls. We squish it in the in the in the heart. Uh, question: uh, Can we just like have the babies instead of quartering the baby? No, uh, no, no, no. That we're getting into like a King Solomon thing there. I feel like you're tricking me. We're doing the quarters. So, so I had to look up this speech. This is in fact a real speech with real words, really spoken by Bernie Nathanson, the person whose mouth they have them coming out of, 10 years ago after he became a pro-life activist. But, Weird. <laughs> yeah. Weird. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'm sure it was just like that in real life, though. And by the way, this is also where he says that the last step in the abortion is where you put all the pieces back together <laughs> so that you can do the little puppet show with them later. <laughs> <laughs> and then you quarter the quarters with four tardigrades if you want to. <laughs> you can keep going. It's adorable. Yeah, but so, but after he gets done with his little speech, they clear the room out and they let him know that they found the evil abortionist guys have found the perfect victim or test case for their abortion laws in Texas. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and Jewy McJewerson says, uh, guys, just as an aside here, like, I kind of feel like we should have twirly mustaches. Yeah. This scene. Like, is there, <laughs> can we do a snidely whiplash? Uh, 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 by the way, can I call Mwahaha? I know you yeah. guys are doing Mwahaha, but <laughs> right, I really right. love, yeah, yeah. Fair, love fair. Mwahaha to yeah. be mine. Yeah. Yeah. So, OK, so we cut over to the Planned Parenthood in Dallas where they're. You know, they're talking about what a great test case they've got. They're like, oh, yeah, no, she's awful. She's a runaway, an alcoholic, a school dropout, a drug addict, a lesbian. And everybody's like, awesome. That's great. (laughs) Question, Noah, did did the word lesbian mean something different in the 1970s (laughs) than it does today? I'm just. The the fact that there's a pregnancy at the end of this is very weird. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. So, but, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this is also where they introduce us to those dumb old lady lawyers that Planned Parenthood recruited so that they could manipulate them and tell them what to do. Okay. Right. <sighs> this is fucking great. Okay. Because, like, to take two of the lawyers who argued Roe versus Wade and be like, nah, they were just taking their cues from Larry fucking Nadler. Yes. <sighs> yeah. They might as well be like, I don't know, Wonka really called the shots behind the food pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we, we learn about how Jane Rowe got her name, right? Mm-hmm. So the point was, and I think this is the point the movie made by accident and didn't realize what was happening. They're like, okay, so they decided to call her Jane Rowe so that the good guys in our movie wouldn't threaten to kill her. Yep. Right. Yeah. We're the... Uh, Fade out? Stacy Dash, say something stupid. <laughs> so I'm still not over the lady lawyer bit, right? Because, look, I, the movie does not insinuate. It flat out says, a uh, lawyer can't get a job, am I right? She must be the dumbest fucking thing on the planet. Yes, right. And it'll be super easy for us to manipulate. That is not what that the movie exactly implies. That is exactly what the... It, yeah, it's what it says. Now, look... Linda Coffey graduated the top of her goddamn class. In 1968, Texas printed the score you got on the bar exam in the newspapers, and she got an 87, which was the second highest score in the entire state of goddamn Texas. Okay, 
Then that's what got her a federal clerkship with Sarah Hughes. Put a pin in that. Yeah, whatever. Silver medal, second place, boo. <laughs> you know why Linda Coffey couldn't get a job in the law? I can guess. Because law firms were fucking boys clubs in the 1970s, and they openly discriminated against women, and the goddamn men who made this goddamn horrible movie about how terrible feminism is are the motherfuckers responsible for that injustice. Yes. Ugh. Right. But yes. this movie will portray her as eating a lipstick when we meet her. It, 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 it. You are not. It, ugh. Yeah. This popsicle is bad. What do I do, Larry Nader? Right. No, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. So, <sighs> yeah. So, but first we have to ha head on down to the Isle of Hedonism where Birdie <laughs> yeah. and Larry are planning their next move. So right? we plotted baby killing the whole country while sipping Mai Tais and smoking cigars at our Caribbean lair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you doing that? <laughs> I thought you were doing bois. I almost went with best worst gotcha where they were like, Larry Nadler admits that he went on vacation to, to the <laughs> Yes, yes, right. <laughs> Not like with Planned Parenthood money or nope. smuggled like money nope. anything. He just went on vacations to the beach in this movie. He's like, hey, you're going to tell me a person who enjoyed sunshine and sand cares about women? I think not. <laughs> So, yeah, and so this scene exists for no purpose but to do that, right? Because the only other things that happen is that Larry says, well, you need to tell him that life doesn't begin at conception, which we've already established is a thing he wants him to do, and for him to say that we need a villain and it should be the Catholics, which we've already established is their villain, right? Yep. So the only thing being communicated here is, oh, beaches, motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah, because... The evil plot they hatch in this scene is like, yes, we'll blame the Catholics, even though, again, this movie has admitted that Catholics are behind the anti-abortion movement. And B, that's not a bad thing, according to this movie. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. OK, so so now it's time for us to meet Jane Rowe, right? It's to meet Norma McCorvey, and she's meeting her lawyers at a pizza place. Yeah. And inexplicably. Sarah Weddington, the other lawyer, also, by the way, perfectly competent lawyer, is for some reason in this scene <laughs> dressed as a Victorian school marm. Yeah. What? Why? No. what? That was what? the day the costume department quit and they were just like, quick to Halloween adventure. <laughs> Old timey lady clothes. <laughs> Well, I love this moment, too, because like Jane Rowe asks the two lawyers, she's like, well, so, hey, I want to get an abortion. Do you guys know where I can get one? And they're like, no, I can't help you there. And the voiceover cuts in to be like, they totally could have got her a fucking illegal abortion. They were lying motherfuckers. Yeah. And this movie triples down on that. It's like they were so evil. They could have exactly pointed her to Mexico on the flight because, you know, that's when uh, and I forget whether it was uh, Sarah who got her or not. But, you know, one of the lawyers, it's later revealed, had gotten her own illegal abortion down in Mexico. And I'm sitting there thinking like. Illegal abortions are dangerous. Right? Yeah. The fact that the abortion laws in Texas were so restrictive, the young women would lie to their own lawyers about being raped. Right. Like that's she's not the one you should be mad at, you motherfuckers. Oh. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Because then they say, like, she's she's like, you know, how did you get pregnant? She's like, I, I was raped. And the voiceover cuts in to say that's bullshit, too. She admitted later she's a fucking liar. She wasn't raped. Wow. Yep. She lied because under the laws of the existing time, she would have a chance at an abortion in yes. Texas. But of course, that got snatched away from her. And the fact that they're like, oh, well, you know, because a lot of people know that Jane Roe later on in her life, because of the constant harassment she got from Christians, changed her mind and became no, it was because of money. It was, she right, was paid money. To change and, her yeah, mind. she was paid and then threatened on top of that. But like, they're trying to use this scene where her lawyers who are trying to get her help as a gotcha. They're like, yeah, she was a liar about being raped, and then her doctor wouldn't give her a special underground chlorine bleach pill to take. Yeah. What a bunch of assholes. Yeah. Well, in fairness to the movie, these two lawyers explained abortion as just like peeling pepperoni off the top of a pizza. Uh, yeah. uh, so and that's a real thing that happened, right, Andrew? Oh, yeah. Well, so that's another big part that they have to set up, right? They have to set up the idea that Norma had no idea that a, 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 an abortion would kill a living fetus. So she says, so like uh, when they do the... Uh, the abortion, they just shove it back up into my ovaries until I'm ready, right? Something like that. <laughs> and the lawyers are like, oh, really? something like that. Yeah, yeah sure. we just put it back up there and we're like, stay. Stay. <laughs> do you? Yep. Now, That's how we you do put it. my baby into a time machine and then he goes back to the future when I'm ready and yeah, this Marty McFly <laughs> right. fucks his mom. Yeah, whatever you say, Norma. How's that pizza treating you? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <sighs> and then we flash. So she's like, yeah, no, I'll sign your lawyer papers. And then we cut immediately, like a second later, to her having the baby going, damn those lawyers for lying to me and not getting me an illegal Mexico abortion. This doesn't look like pepperoni at all, you fucking liars. <laughs> Curse you. you. Curse you, abortion liars. Curse you. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. The fucking movie just faulted the pro-abortion side for the fact that Norma McCorvey had to birth her child. So I need a minute to breathe into a bag. I don't know about anybody else, but we will be back after that with even more Roe v. Wade. Oh, we, what about Le Maguin de Babo? Oh, oh, we have to totally, go there. Totally, yes. Yeah. Great hey guys, idea. Guys, guys, what you doing? Oh, we're, we're planning all the restaurants we're going to go to when we see each other. Yeah. So yeah. this place, the sock, everyone who goes there has to wear one sock. What, well, like, like just one sock or, or do you have to like wear a specific sock? Both, Both, obviously. (laughs) That sounds unpleasant and also has nothing to do with food. (laughs) Nothing to do with food, he says. Like, I'm going to enjoy the orange soup with the sock without wearing the sock. (laughs) So stupid. Be serious, Noah. Come on. Guys, if you want to eat delicious food, why don't you just try HelloFresh? What's What's HelloFresh? Andrew, I was first. You heard me. I was first. first. No, Andrew, it was me. It was me. You have to adjudicate this. You guys have to have to stop asking me to adjudicate this. What are you even for then? With yeah, with, <clears throat> with HelloFresh, you get fresh pre-measured ingredients and mouthwatering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. Wow, that does sound good. So how does it work? HelloFresh offers 25 plus recipes to choose from each week, from vegetarian meals to craft burgers and extra special gourmet options. There's something for everyone to enjoy with all recipes designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. I don't know, Noah. That sounds kind of expensive. Actually, according to the Zagat Dining Survey, HelloFresh is 28% cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store and 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal without sacrificing the quality. Yeah, that's right. HelloFresh sent us a box to try, and even I was impressed with the quality of ingredients as well as the simplicity of the recipes. And right now, you can go to HelloFresh.com slash Awful12 and use our code Awful12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. So I go to HelloFresh.com slash Awful12 and use code Awful12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping? That's right. All right, Noah, we're in. Nice. So... We can forget about this place, the sock. Oh, <laughs> no, hell, we're still totally going no. there. We're going yeah, to sock. I hear they have an appetizer that you can only see if you really believe in it. Ooh, I'm gonna get two of those. Oh. Get two. <laughs> Hanukkah, oh Hanukkah, come light the menorah. Uh, Doctor Nathanson. Oh, yeah, Doctor Nathanson. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for coming in. Oh boy, it's so hot in here. Do you guys mind if I turn on the AC? Oh, uh, yeah. Sure. However you're comfortable. No problem. Oh, geez. Would you look at that? Set to 72 degrees. No wonder. Whew. 71. There we go. That will be much, much better. Uh, right, right, right. So, look, we are very excited to make a movie of the real story behind Roe v. Wade. Mm-hmm. That's right. I was there for all the abortions of the 1970s. And so I know the real scoop of poop. For instance, me and Larry Nadler, we just made up all the abortion statistics. Um, Did you know that? Sorry, you made up all the abortion statistics? Mm Mm-hmm. And and people just printed whatever we told them. That's literally unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Liberals, right? No, no, I I mean, literally, I I don't believe you. I feel like you could just Google those numbers. Oh, but you see, if you Google it now, they're real. What? But when we made them up, they weren't real. Uh, yeah, 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 wait, you're saying the statistics you made up in the 1970s came true Came now. true, exactly, exactly, <laughs> yeah. But we were making so much money doing abortions that none of it mattered. Right. Okay, well, this is a pro-life movie, so I think we can probably just make the whole movie based on that. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Nice. Yeah. Great. I'm sorry. Do you mind if I adjust the thermostat? It is freezing in here. I mean, you just recently. Ah, just see, a second this ago. is your problem. Okay. 71 degrees. This should be set to 72. Okay. That was what it was. 
and we're back for more of this shit. Now it's time to meet Dallas District Attorney Henry Wade, <laughs> who did not get the memo, apparently, that he was supposed to be the good guy in this movie. I, <laughs> I really appreciate them casting Boss Hog as Henry Wade here. <laughs> Yeah, so his underling or whatever comes to him and says, oh, they're filing this abortion case. And his job at this point in the movie is to just sit there and go, Psh, abortion. No shark is going to attack my beach, you know. OK, <laughs> yeah. And the point of this is like, well, um, Roe versus Wade only made it to the Supreme Court because Henry Wade wasn't trying and the sun was in his eyes. Right. Yes. And also he was busy that weekend. <laughs> yeah. They sit there having the conversation. Well, this could never win. Abortion is baby murder. Yes, it's murdering a baby. Best be because you murder a baby during it. Right. Murder baby. Uh, yeah. And, and <laughs> this begins the, the movie's inexplicable and entirely gratuitous assault on Sarah Hughes. Yep. By the way, first female federal judge in the state of Texas, right? They want to portray her as like some kind of crazy affirmative action hire. But let's see, like um, graduated top of her class, GW Law Review, which she attended part time at night while working during the day as a police officer. And since it was 1919, they didn't give lady cops guns or badges or uniforms and she lived in a fucking tent down by the river i am not making any of this up her job was to track down suicidal runaways which she did during the day while attending law school at night she commuted to school and i wish i were making this up too in a fucking canoe what yeah so <laughs> she graduated right she got the same law degree i did that took me three years in three years, right? Wow. And, yeah, while attending an hour a night and not sleeping. Couldn't get a job as a lawyer because lady parts. Got herself elected to the fucking Texas House of Representatives for three consecutive terms in the 1930s. Was then appointed to the state bench. Served as the first first females comes up a lot in her autobiography, right? Served as the first female state judge in all of goddamn Texas for 25 years until John F. Kennedy appointed her to the federal bench. Oh, by the way, liberal icon John F. Kennedy, Sarah Hughes would be the only woman appointed to the federal bench wow. during Kennedy's term. So <laughs> I I'm a little mad at her being portrayed as like, that crazy winky lady lawyer. Yes, right. Yeah, and we'll get to it. But yeah, they make her into just sort of a ditz in this movie. <laughs> well, of course, women can't law. Right. Well, right, right, right. So we cut to the the young lawyer arguing his case in Roe v. Wade round one. And he's arguing that they don't have standing because the state already forced Jane Roe to birth her rape baby. So what does it even fucking matter anymore? <laughs> Yeah, come on, that argument wouldn't work in 1970. It just works now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, the movie is aware, is more aware than the Fifth Circuit that pff, it takes fucking forever to get to trial and only nine months to have a baby. Am I right? Isn't a great argument for your side? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but the movie is trying to portray it like he's just wiping the floor with uh, with these judges with his like awesome arguments. But the judges are such activists that they're just not hearing him at all. So, again, <laughs> sidebar, true fact, the actual Roe v. Wade legal team was so concerned that they would get homered at the district court level that they had an abortion doctor, a guy named Dr. James Halford, joined to the case at trial to survive precisely this argument, right? Because the abortion doctor definitely has standing because, you know, he's the one that could be arrested under oh, the Texas law. Oh, okay, yeah. interesting. They yeah. didn't mention that in the movie. We kind of weird on that, huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, huh. Then, and then the fucking the pro-abortion lady lawyer comes up and they literally have this judge, this legendary liberal icon of a judge that, that, that Andrew was just telling us about. Wink at lady lawyer like I got you on this Andrew. one, sister. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have a few questions about uh, the law. Do judges and lawyers give like knowing glances and winks when they're friends at the beginning of stuff? Does no, that happen a lot? No, and, and, and in fact, like the most 
terrifying moments in my legal career have been when I've had to argue in front of, I, I, I fortunately, I never had an argument in front of the judge for whom I clerked on the Maryland Court of Appeals. He would have torn me a new one at oral argument. But like, I have friends on the federal bench and like, they go out of their way to be impartial, which means you have to be twice as good. Yeah, oh, I was. I yeah. You don't do a wink. You do like what? You touch the ear. Like yeah. You don't have a, <laughs> a series of nonverbal signals like a yeah. baseball beat. Oh, <laughs> got it. Yeah. Yeah. So but she comes up and she gives her like she at first she's fucking up and the judges keep like throwing her hints and better arguments and everything. But then eventually she gets around to her pro abortion speech and it's, of course, it's just the most anodyne thing you can imagine because it's been written by a viciously anti-abortion person. But then the crowd goes wild for it. And that's when the other lawyers know that they might be in some trouble. <laughs> right? They go for a Air Bud has just scored his first basket moment in their <laughs> pro yes. life movie. <laughs> And and so we cut to dismissive D.A. And he's very upset that this other lawyer didn't lawyer better. Damn it. OK, this scene is fucking amazing. They did not write it on purpose because this very serious like, I don't know, gentlemen, I think we could do is being interrupted constantly by this lawyer being like, fuck you, Kyle. You suck a fat dick. You oh, fuck your fucking dad, Kyle. You fat bitch. You fat. And again, in the foreground, they're just like, well, this might go to the third. Fuck you. Fuck your face. Fuck you. Well, there's also a moment here where the DA guy, he turns to one of his underlings and he's like, you know, he's telling him to to dig up some dirt on this Jane Roe. He's like, I need you to dig into the sex life of a teen runaway that we forced to birth a child. I'm the good guy in this movie, damn it. <laughs> Get me some dirt on that 15 year old. Go dox the rape victim now, right? the good guy. <laughs> yes. That's what happens here. Yep. Yep. Ah, oh, and then we all but fucking star wipe our way to the Supreme Court. Right. <laughs> and then, you know, yada, 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 it made it to the Supreme Court. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. So we get Justice John Voigt having a conversation with about just how politicized the SCOTUS is just then. They're, they're, they're using court vacancies as political footballs. Can you imagine? This is so crazy. <laughs> yeah. This whole conversation is like, we should probably have the entire court of nine because at this moment they had seven and Nixon was trying to get two more in and they're, they're talking about that. They're like, yeah, we need not, we'd never just like delay that for over a year. That would fuck up everything. We need to uh, have a full <sighs> Supreme Court. All right, strap in. Okay. <laughs> so, so the movie says it's the liberal Senate that's denying Richard Nixon his judges. You will not be surprised to learn that is not remotely true. You did have two open seats in the fall of 1971 on the Supreme Court. For like a month. It, for like three months, yeah. For, for Hugo Black and uh, Justice Harlan II, right? Nixon's first two choices to replace those guys were people I had to look up on Wikipedia, okay? The first <laughs> guy, I swear I'm not making this up, was a guy named Herschel Friday. Great name. He'd never been a judge. He was in private practice. Okay, look like you can go from private practice straight to the Supreme Court, but they're probably going to be interested in, well, okay, what kind of cases have you done, right? And Herschel listed number one on his Senate application, and I swear to God, I am not making this up. His most prominent case, he said, well, there was that time when I argued for segregation well, on behalf of the Little Rock, Arkansas School District four Jesus years Christ. after the Supreme Court decided Brown versus Board of Education. I'm also really good with Excel and I can <laughs> juggle. Yeah. And, and so, so unsurprisingly, the ABA rated him as not at all fucking qualified and probably a racist asshole, right? And Nixon had to pull his nomination. The second person, this is a little bit more complicated, but was a California judge named Mildred Lilly, who, on the one hand, the foremost constitutional expert on the planet, Lawrence Tribe, has described as, quote, both right wing and stupid. <laughs> Redundant. <laughs> but but again, also rated not qualified by the ABA. Right. So Nixon pulled those two nominees after a couple of months and replaced them with conservative Lewis Powell who was confirmed 89 to one and 
uber conservative William Rehnquist. Yeah. That William Rehnquist, <sighs> who was confirmed 68 to 26, even though he said, and I quote, I realize that it is an unpopular and unhumanitarian position for which I have been excoriated by my liberal colleagues. But I think Plessy v. Ferguson was right and should be reaffirmed. Wow. Sorry, yeah. Plessy yeah, v. The, Ferguson. The separate, separate but, but equal. equal. Yeah, that right. So, so those are word for word things that William Rehnquist said that, you know— cost him 26 votes to be on the Supreme Court. So the idea that you're retroactively making this into a Mitch McConnell, the liberals won't give us our guy. Like, yeah. the liberals gave you the guy who said Plessy v. Ferguson was right. Right. right? Like, I, I am 100% positive that if we'd have had Mildred Lilly instead of William Rehnquist, <laughs> that the direction, you know, the arrow of morality would have gone straight up from that moment. Yeah. So. Now, but so, but the other purpose of this scene, of course, is to show that Justice Berger, that's John Voight's character, doesn't think this Roe v. Wade thing is going to end up being very important. They don't have to delay that for more justices. It's going to not matter. Come on. Yeah, I, Come I on. wrote in my notes, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Supreme Court Justice C.J. Berger. <laughs> 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 so, all right. So now we get that amazing not con law class that uh, Heath was talking about, right? So <laughs> <laughs> we got to Fordham University where professor of very legal stuff, Joey Lawrence, is going to just bitch about abortion at his students for a few minutes. <laughs> and to be clear, it's a constitutional law class. But like Robert Byrne was not a constitutional law professor, right? He's a real person. Yeah, real guy, not a con law professor. He taught criminal law, criminal procedure, okay, and torts. Right, being anti-abortion <laughs> was was literally just his hobby. Okay, so and look, it's not like he didn't ask to teach con law. Right, he did, and and I want you to let this sink in for a minute. The Jesuit Catholic Fordham University listened to Joey Lawrence in real life rail about abortion and was like. Yeah, man, like, that's cool so long as it's your private opinion and you never, ever teach that nonsense <laughs> wow. to any of our law students ever, okay? And then Joey was like, well, deal. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And then he ran a class. Somehow he started his own, like, pop-up con law class in addition <laughs> to his actual specialty. And he'd go up to the front of the room and be like, all right, somebody give the best argument for abortion that you can. This will be the best argument. And I'll then respond. So some girl is like, hey, uh, we should control our bodies. Here's the exact best argument for this. If I can fit a person in my ass, I get to murder them. That's what feminism <laughs> means. <laughs> and then Joey Lawrence is like, let's uh, let's be rational. That might be wrong. Oh, my God. Yeah. The arguments are so bad. Right. Like, so at one point, one of the students is like, only fanatics are against abortion. He goes, oh, is Mother Teresa a fanatic? And we're yes. like, of yeah. course. It's absolutely. So he's like, what Teresa. about the Dalai Lama? It's like, he's the fucking Dalai Lama. Man. <laughs> he's the definite. <laughs> you mean the guy who wears his ceremonial robe who was chosen? at birth because he has the Buddha's soul within his eyes? <laughs> that guy? Yeah, I'd say he's what? super into his thing, man. Uh, uh, I, I also love that there's there's a, they actually have a female student that's like, hey, did you even realize that you just listed a bunch of men? You didn't list any women whatsoever on this women's rights issue? <laughs> Right. And we also get the great, like, it's my body, it's my choice. And he's like, but the baby isn't your body. All of your body shares, real quote, all of your body shares your DNA. Your child does not have your DNA. All right. So this is a weird point and everything, but the majority of DNA in your body doesn't belong to you. It's not your <laughs> DNA, right? Yeah. So so by, by this same argument, like I, I can't kill gut bacteria, right? I couldn't take an antibiotic. <laughs> yes. Jesus. Primordial ooze is a person, according <laughs> to this argument. Right. And then the one student who I guess wandered in from a real law class is like, hey, isn't it more that we're not entitled to use other people's bodies to survive? Like, we're not allowed to just cut kidneys out of people willy nilly and take them. And he goes, when you were two, you never would have survived in the forest. And he's like, all right, well. well <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and they even do the goddamn you just killed Beethoven bit. Oh, God. <laughs> First of all, this fucking bit needs to start with, all right, it's 1770. <laughs> <laughs> he introduces this mystifyingly as, I have a riddle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what walks on Exodus, three legs is at sunset? Riddle me this. <laughs> Should you murder Beethoven? Oh, I damn it. it. Damn it. I always fuck Dude. that up. <laughs> uh, the, the boy was, I honestly thought it was going to be like the surgeon is a woman. If he had ended <laughs> with the surgeon is the woman, it would have been his strongest argument. <laughs> Where do they bury the survivors? Yes. <laughs> ah. So, yeah. Also, by the way, I have to point out that because they, they have him talking in the front of this gigantic auditorium, but they could only get 17 extras for this shot. So they've yeah. got him just littered strategically throughout the auditorium. <laughs> Everyone, welcome to Constitutional <laughs> Law, taught by me, Robert Byrne. Just go ahead and scatter throughout the classroom wherever you like. <laughs> look, look to your left. Look to your right. You, you may have nobody, to like put your hand over there, your eyes. To <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then we cut to Bernie having to turn a woman down for his abortion. Right. We go to we cut to the hospital where he works, and they give. The, I guess they have a quota, and they won't let him go over that. For his abortions. Yeah. And he's like, can we get, I don't know, like rollover minutes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. like, cap and trade system. Yeah. I feel like we should have. That's not a reasonable thing with the quotas. Hard caps. He, he, he does. He's like, yeah, Bob isn't using his abortions. I'll take those. Yeah, also. right. I want it Bob's was. abortion. Oh, God. It was so the good. The invisible hand that guides the pest. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I heard myself saying it. <laughs> Bob, are you not using your abortions? Are you saving them up so that you can do it right before you leave for the year? You're doing like 20 abortions all at once. You're not allowed to use your abortions that way, Bob. Company Jeez. policy. <laughs> But of course, the, the reason that we get this scene is because up until this point in the movie, he's been Bernie has been wrestling with whether he should open his own clinic that's dedicated to abortion. And this is pushing him over the edge. Yes, this is also where he gives, I'm going to say it, the most Jewish monologue ever. <laughs> he's like, you give me half portions in the cafeteria <laughs> and you call me names. <laughs> half portions in the cafeteria. Oh. <laughs> I saw how much mashed potatoes he got. This is because I kill babies, isn't it? <laughs> and even at the end of it, he he goes, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to use my control of the media against you. <laughs> Dear podcast listener, you you may be hearing us laughing along and thinking these are jokes. Oh no, all of that was one hundred percent real dialogue yeah. from this real fucking movie. You, you can't exaggerate oh, this movie. It's, no, it's, no, it's, it's mm -hmm. something. It's amazing. So yeah, but but so he uses the Jewish control of the media to put an end to the abortion quota system. Yeah, and then we get. Team abortion having cornflakes together. What the fuck is this, this is scene? Nonsense. <laughs> what is it? Nobody wanted to fuck Larry Nagel? <laughs> that, that, that is the point of this scene. Well, and, and that the converse that Jacqueline Smith is still DTF. Like, you know, but I'm sorry. <laughs> right, too late. Yes. It's too late. I, 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 the movie cannot bring me back in. No, no matter what. But oh, she's trying. She's like reaching under the table for his thigh. Like it's yeah. <laughs> I think we can all agree that the point of the scene is the abortion jingle. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. I'm not again. I'm not exaggerating anything. There's literally an abortion jingle that they're going to do now and later in the movie. That's happening. Can, yeah. Can we get can we get Anna to sing the abortion song? <laughs> oh my god. Uh. Anna couldn't help but write a better abortion song. Yeah. Right. It would it would just end up better. At I the could end. go upstairs and wake her right now. <laughs> with a wiffle bat while yelling the word abortion song and she would come up with something better. <laughs> so, yeah, right, right. So we have this weird scene where he's like, you know what we need is a catchy uh, a slogan for abortion or a catchy jingle. Uh, abortion. <laughs> no, nah, that's that's more. Okay, yeah, let's uh, take it too soon. Let's, let's see. Smortion. Smortion. Uh, portion. <laughs> abortion. Uh, you taste so good. No, no, that's not your <laughs> So but Smile. Then, you got abortion. Uh, no. The fucking wife, though, is like, honey, what about that catchy little abortion song you know? 
And everyone in the room is just like, wait, an abortion song? Hold on, honey, go sit at the piano there. We'll do the abortion song. And he literally starts singing a fucking song about how great abortion is. With their kids. The kids yep, yep. sing along with this. Yep. Right. This was bad. There's a fortune in abortion. And all the other rhymes are that good, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and so, and then we get like a team abortion enraged as they are with their anti-Catholic bigotry, dishing out all the oppo research on all the big cardinals. <laughs> oh, this is also the scene where they make up all their abortion numbers. They just, yes. So this is the craziest claim that this movie relies on, in my opinion, right? Mm, No, but yeah, it's a good one. (laughs) That's fair. You know what? That's fair. It's not the crazy. It's one of them, which is that in Dr. Bernard Nathanson's book, he says offhandedly in one sentence, he's like, yeah, we just made up whatever numbers we felt like. No, no, they didn't. But they will spend the rest of the movie pretending like him and Larry Nagel were just like, hmm... Five out of ten people have had an abortion. Boom. Put it in the New York Times. Yeah, right. Exactly. And then, of course, this is where they finally come up with their good, catchy slogan. They were they're going to be pro choice. (gasps) Apparently, that's a slogan now. Right. And then we, we have to cut over to the. And like the abortion Avengers headquarters and they're like, well, that's so disingenuous. We here at the National Right to Life headquarters don't think that's very descriptive of their position at all. <laughs> let's uh, let's watch this newsman played by Mike Lindell. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. OK, is. this is literally Mike Lindell. By the way, it took absolutely zero makeup or wardrobe to make Mike Lindell into creepy 70s local news guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not even a little. <laughs> yeah. The role he was like, born you're to done. play. You're, we're shooting you. <laughs> Type casting. Listen, makers of this movie, Nick Loeb, I know you are self-obsessed enough. You are listening to this podcast. There is no amount of money I won't pay you for the footage you wasted trying to get Mike Lindell to say a complete sentence. Do you hear me, Nick? I can't get you those that comeback from Sofia Vergara, but I can get you big Patreon. Dog. I know you have an hour of cut footage where Mike Lindell was just like, hope the what the what the now the golden bandit. I just want all of it. Let me make it into a tech a techno remix. Oh, I'll steal you one fetus for every <laughs> hour of Mike Lindell B roll uh, you get me. Oh, we need Lil Nas X sampling Mike Lindell. Oh, <laughs> that would be that would be amazing. I can't let it pass though that this scene is the poor, beleaguered National Right to Life League. Yes. Bemoaning amongst themselves. If only we had the money to stand up to a grassroots nonprofit funded by Jew Gold. Yeah, right. right. And then mm. the lead like person bemoaning that, Professor Joey Lawrence, does not have the self awareness to realize he's two feet away from Cardinal Biggles, right? Like yeah. you know, you're just sort of thinking, like, hey, uh, your direct supervisor doesn't happen to live tax free in an entire country made literally of equal parts Nazi gold and priceless art, does he? Because you know that might help us with our money troubles. Yeah, I, Jesus uh, Christ. Yeah, that is the the Catholic Church was outspent lobbying on abortion. Out this movie, we the Catholic Church were outspent. <laughs> yep, man. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So then we hustle our way over to the Supreme Court. The VO cuts in to remind us that there are only seven judges because A, he was pretty sure we would forget, and B, the voiceover cannot shut the fuck up God. for any amount of time. <laughs> I love, like, the first of the justices to speak is Foghorn Leghorn, Justice Leghorn. <laughs> it, sorry, like, this Southern accent is so goddamn bad. And I mean, you know, look, I know mine ain't exactly perfect, <laughs> but Jesus <laughs> Christ, at this shit. Playing, playing William Brennan from Newark, New Jersey, <laughs> yeah, I might add. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no. To be fair, a fucking Tony D New Jersey accent would have won me back over this movie. Hey, what's with all these dames wanting these abortions? Am I right? <laughs> also, okay. So oh. then, but then fucking abortion lawyer comes up for his opening bit and it's just unapologetic sexism. How do you get a blonde to give you a blowjob? I'm arguing in front of the Supreme Court, huh? 
<laughs> Who's drinking tonight? Yeah, his literal line is, when a man argues against two beautiful ladies, they're always going to have the last word. And then just a bunch of crickets show it, up. It's giant <laughs> pause where he's like, ah, who's drinking? Uh, I need to tell you. That really happened. Oh, I don't doubt it for a second. J. Floyd really did make that quote unquote joke. Now, an inquisitive scriptwriter might ask, hmm, does it mean something when the male assistant attorney general could open up his argument before the entirely male Supreme Court? Yes. In a topic about women's rights with a sexist remark masquerading as a joke. Uh, this is not that movie. Yeah, <laughs> right. No, not at all. And and look, again, that's not even a fucking joke, right? Like Andrew's no. here for the law stuff. I know jokes. That's not a fucking yeah. joke. That's <laughs> just unapologetic sexism. If it would please the court, I'd like a location and a job, please. <laughs> <laughs> he might as well open up with bitches be shopping. Right. All yeah. right. Back yeah. to our Supreme Courting. <laughs> so, yeah. So the abortion Avengers dribble out of court. Very disappointed. Their side didn't do very good at all. Baseball's stupid anyway. Shouldn't yeah. even get it. in <laughs> sport. <laughs> we not even agree to the rules. Court is supposed to just sit there. I haven't heard Andrew's last two episodes on originalism. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they're mad because they, they think this is a feminist conspiracy by seven old men. Yeah. Right. No, he actually says this is it. Joey Lawrence's character says this is a conspiracy. This is their fucking movie. Yep. And then the DA jumps in and goes, well, the problem is our lawyer is terrible. I'm like, doesn't that guy work for you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our lawyer did a bad job. Otherwise, we would rematch. Rematch right now. <laughs> but we get to call fetuses as witnesses because we weren't best two out of allowed. Three. Let's do. Let's see if they'll do best two out of three. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Noah's making a joke, but we're going to get to it. That's kind of what happens. Yeah, that exactly. is, is historically what happens. Yeah, yeah. right. So, yeah, so we cut to the SCOTUS room where they're all voting, and I have to know, Andrew, do they really have little temp uh, nameplates in the room where they all... I feel, like, I feel like they would just know each other's names. Like, they, 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 seven people you work with every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you do take little straw votes after oral argument mm -hmm. to, to figure out, you know, where the justices are. But, yeah, this entire scene is total fucking I, well let me let you let me let you set it up first because uh i've, I've got an angry unhinged rant so oh uh, the supreme court justices have a shoving match <laughs> they rolling around <laughs> on top of the table while one of them takes a difficult shit in the corner <laughs> if this is how the supreme court works i'm totally unbothered by the fact that it's filled with right-wing theocrats <laughs> i didn't realize it was the fucking wwe after show it's yeah. fine yeah Kavanaugh's not a problem. Get yeah. go Third good in Marshall there. with the folding chair. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me be more specific here, right? It's it's not just the reenactment. It is the entire premise of this scene, right? The whole idea is the court is getting ready to vote 4-3 in favor of abortion. Okay, but it's there are only seven justices on the Supreme Court. So if we can somehow delay it, because Nixon's got those two people that the liberals are not holding up, but his incompetence, so that'll be two more votes. It'll be five to four. We'll win. Never minding, right, that they get the delay that they want. We're going to get there. Mm -hmm. But like, okay, this straw vote, every piece of available evidence tells us that this straw vote was seven to zero to affirm. OK, you don't have to take my word for what I'm about to explain, because all you need to know is that the like all the behind the scenes machinations here are from Chief Justice John Voigt, Warren Berger. Right. And Berger will vote with the majority in yeah. what ultimately becomes yeah. the Roe v. Wade opinion. Right. So spoiler. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Roe v. Wade ends like Roe v. Wade does in real yeah. life. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I spent so much of this movie going like. But wasn't it 7-2? <laughs> it, the title of the movie is a spoiler. Literally, yeah. yes. the title. Uh, yes. And what's what's so wonderful is they're just, this is the movie version of, okay, so you lose 7-2. to two. I would like to count again, <laughs> and I would also like to make up how you guys thought about what you were thinking uh, yeah. before we did this. <laughs> so the movie says that Oren Berger was secretly going to 
rehear the case. By the way, that's not a secret thing. You have to publish an order to do that, right? Like you, <laughs> you got to type it up, put it in print and publish it in a book, but whatever. And William O. Douglas was so angry about that, that he was going to expose the secret conspiracy, something or other, and went around and blackmailed all of the other justices yeah. to vote his side. None of that, that's just insane. Here's what actually happened. Right? And, and the, the, because there's some weird law stuff, like, I don't know, I guess it seems sort of plausible, but here's what actually happened. First, the vote was seven, nothing to affirm. Okay. Where the split was, and, and you've got to keep this in mind whenever this case is sort of talking about the realignment between the first hearing and the second hearing, it was not on affirm or reverse, right? It was how far are we going to go, right? How expansive is this opinion going to be? But seven, nothing to affirm. Warren Berger assigns the opinion to Harry Blackman, who was more conservative and also junior to William O. Douglas on the side. And Blackman also had a reputation for being the slowest writer on the Supreme Court. Okay. So Douglas thought, oh, I see what's going to happen. We're going to get this like wishy-washy opinion that doesn't fully capture what the majority wants. And by the way, you're giving it to Blackman here who's super slow because it's 1971. You want it to take like a year. You want this opinion to come out after the November 1972 election so that Richard Nixon's court doesn't strike down abortion, right? And it, it doesn't hurt your buddy, Richard Nixon. Okay. And then when the motion for reconsideration came down. Douglas was 100% convinced of that. He was super fucking pissed, right? So what really happened was William Brennan pulled him aside and was like, hey, man, calm down. And and William O. Douglas was like, well, you're probably right. I should calm down. So, but in this movie, it's like a fucking scene out of the Americans, right? Like there's, there's, <laughs> there's like a 30-minute espionage montage around them. Can we just face each other on these benches? This is crazy. <laughs> We're Supreme Court justices. In this movie, it's the last half hour of Casino. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. They're, they're digging trenches in the <laughs> desert. Like, <yeah. laughs> it's, it's so fucking good. Also, him appointing the junior guy to the court at first is so silly. He's like, because he's my little buddy and I love him the most. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> And then, okay, we get all the, all the like the pro-abortion justices getting together to connive on how to how to change this thing. This is where we learn that this movie is so fucking bizarre in this. They say the words she volunteers for Planned Parenthood, right? Uh, uh, speaking of one of the justices' wives, and then immediately say, "Wait, your wife works for Planned Parenthood?" Yeah. <laughs> No, no. Those are two different propositions. They will use those two terms interchangeably throughout the rest of this movie. Also, put a pin in the Planned Parenthood for a scene. That's all. We'll pull it out real soon. <laughs> but but I need to say the voiceover explicitly says, well, that's a conflict of interest because, you know, and, and I'm just thinking like, you know, tell you what, right wingers, I will trade retroactive recusal of William O. Douglas from the decision in Roe v. Wade, <laughs> which which will now win six to two <laughs> yeah, right. mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. in exchange for every current member of the Roberts court. You recusing themselves whenever they or their wives are active in right wing Republican causes yeah. that come up before the court. And <laughs> I might point out the 28 conservative institutions that Ginny and Clarence Thomas speak right. before, like on a daily basis. Yeah, I was going to say that 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 gets rid of Clarence Thomas altogether. We could just yeah. like get him a nice little retirement home then. Yeah. Yeah. I'll trade you a few more. What, what else can we get? We got three <laughs> more we can trade for stuff, yeah. right? I hear you guys are into Plessy v. Ferguson. Would you yeah. like to revisit that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. But then, okay. So then we have the scene with Roger fucking Stone. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite the actor that Mike Lindell <laughs> turned out to be. Guys. No. Also required no wardrobe. Roger nope. Stone shows up looking like he just killed Kennedy. And they're like, yep, that's perfect. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> guys, guys. Do you not realize Roger Stone? There's there's just the the one word as uh, as as was one of the Supreme Court justices gets out of his car. Roger Stone is playing Bob Woodward in this scene. <laughs> oh, that's God, who I, he's supposed to be. I didn't realize that. he might as well duck back into the car. By the way, Bob, if anyone ever tells you about a plague, 
Um, <laughs> you're gonna get it out there, right? You're gonna tell everybody. Next day on the eggplant. <laughs> fucking amazing and he's so bad like like you, you know how like you've got that one local car dealership in your town that just convinced that they're killing it with their local ads and shit he's like bad for that <laughs> he's like the owner of that car dealership got real bad dementia and you had to visit him as part of some kind of public service oh. and watch him read a script he'd never seen before <laughs> that's Roger Stone's performance plus treason Roger Stone is so bad that he could not convincingly do look at piece of paper no <laughs> He's very clearly looking at a piece of paper with his lines on it without being able to portray look at piece of paper with words on it. <laughs> Don't look away from this. Don't uh, say this out loud. <laughs> Shit. Again. Oh, yeah. We'll buy uh, all of the extra footage, actually, Nick. <laughs> I'll get the Batman. Uh, release the Snyder cut of this movie. <laughs> All I want to do now is I want the opportunity to interview Bob Woodward. And I want to say, like, look, um, you've been played in in cinema by Robert Redford and Roger Stone. How do you, how do you feel well, about that as a range? Which did you prefer? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. So, yeah. But so Justice Berger sees the, the story in the post and he's livid about the leak from the Supreme Court now. Yeah. Oh. Well, he should be because this Washington Post article has traveled through a wormhole from 1979. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, not to ruin the movie. But. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Dorn. Clearly, you need a more talented screenwriter if you want things like distinct acts. So we're going to call that the end of act two and take ourselves a break. But first, let me give act three the hard sell. We'll access the safe and legal abortion, increased female education and employment. Will increased education and employment lead to greater political power for women? Are we all clearly starting to see why the misogynists are so dead set against this shit? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the you're the bad guys and you lost conclusion of <laughs> Roe v. Wade. <sighs> okay. One. Two. Are we going on three or one, two, three, go? On three. One, two, three, go is no, on no, no. four. No, it's on go, I would say, on the... It would be one, two, Heath, go. Eli, you, you, you said there was an emergency. Yes, Andrew. Thank goodness. Is it one, two, three, or one, two, three, go? Generally. Like legally speaking. Uh, yeah. Legally. I, you Which you called me down here for that. I, you, you know I live in Baltimore, right? Okay. First of all, traffic was very light this morning. And second of all, no, I wanted your help protecting my blenders in this super high-tech safe me and Heath bill. Right. Hence the simultaneous key turns. You want to protect your... Your blenders, like like the the food thing. Oh no, I'm talking <laughs> about blenders. I wear. I got the Natty Ice Lime X twos from them, and they're so cool and stylish. They're perfect for a day at the beach or even just a walk around town. So I want to keep them extra safe, you know. But Eli, unlike expensive big brand shades that you've probably lost or smashed in the past, blenders are actually affordable. So you're not going to cry as much when the inevitable happens. I'm not. No, you're not. And it's not just sunglasses. Blenders has prescription glasses, readers, and blue lights, as well as a snow collection with goggles and accessories. Wow, th those do sound good. H how do I get a pair? To get 15% off your Blenders purchase, visit BlendersEyewear.com and enter promo code AWFULVIP. That's BlendersEyewear.com, code AWFULVIP for 15% off. Blenders, rocked with pride worldwide. Huh, so I guess I don't need a simultaneous turnkey super safe after all. Yeah, it, it it would appear not. So I I guess I I came here for nothing. I mean, you could settle the yeah. number thing. Oh yeah, do that. I yeah. Look, like guys, it's obvious. You go on three, right? One, two, what? three, go That's... is is on four. Ah, yeah. told you. Told no, you. you don't even know. I hate you guys. Harvard's stupid. <laughs> Justice White, Justice Brennan, I'd like to have a word with you about this Roe v. Wade case. Yeah, uh, what about it? Well, I know you're planning to vote no, but I'm afraid I need you to change your mind. Oh, yeah? Well, how do you plan to do that? Well, have you considered that you are a poo-poo face? Sorry, I'm a poo-poo face? That's right, Justice. If you can't afford to find it inside yourself to take our side on this issue, I'm afraid I'll have to tell the press that you... 
or a poo poo face. You would not do that. You I would. would. No. Hey guys, what are you talking about? Yes, it was go go away, just nobody likes you. This is the cool kids table. You. you can't sit here. Get out of here. You you guys suck. Go go sit with the black guy. Fine. Good. Okay, but uh, I don't understand why the sudden change of heart. We both know that Roe v. Wade is an easy case that Christians should totally win. Why are you doing this? If you must know, it turns out that my wife is a woman. That's not possible. Yes, I didn't know myself until last night. But knowing that now, I'm totally corrupted and I'm going to change this decision to pro-baby killing. Okay, well, you leave me no choice. I just have one question for you. What? What's that? Will you trade chips for a chocolate milk? Yeah. Okay. Nice. This is this is how the Supreme Court works. Mm. Love chocolate milk. (laughs) (laughs) And we're back for more of this shit. We're going to open up on the VO telling us about the abortion flights to El Paso. (laughs) Yeah, they called it abortion airways and. I would love to see those pre-flight announcements. It's just like, okay, on the left, everyone in an exit row. God, this was ridiculous. So they're explaining this. They're like, yeah, so pregnant women were flying to El Paso and then crossing the border to Mexico for these really terrifying procedures. And we, the bad guys, wanted to change that. Yeah. That's what's happening. Right. Now, first of all, they show us a, a shot of the airport as these people are getting to the plane. They're all so goddamn pregnant, right? Oh, they're yeah. all eight and a half <laughs> months in. <laughs> and then they're like, and also, we did fundraising at the Playboy Mansion, so we're not really feminists. That's the best part. We exploited women for women's rights. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, you didn't. <laughs> yeah, man. Fucking Hugh Hefner is more progressive than you are on women's rights. Deal with it. That's it's your movie. <laughs> Jesus. We get more, more of the abortion sucking machine. <laughs> mm, more Milo Yiannopoulos. So ridiculous. Uh, with like miming it. So apparently the, the physical motion of an abortion is like reluctant teen angrily vacuums. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just like all pissed about it. <laughs> yeah. And so, okay, then we, we check in on Larry and Bernie down in St. Sinful Isle or whatever, flirting with a couple of babes, telling them about how they invented abortion. <laughs> how they control the media. I wrote my notes. <laughs> they're bragging to the girls about how they control the media. And then they're like, we control the media. They and I was have like, well, the Jewish characters say, and I quote, we control the media. Yep. Jesus Christ. And also have him be like, hey, ladies, I'm the father of abortion. So you want to get out of here? Or what's going on? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Want to hear about how I can lie about statistics? I, yeah. I, look, I'm no pickup artist, but I'm guessing that that's not a great line to lead with at the beach. <laughs> Jesus. The, the, uh. the woman he's flirting with goes like, uh, well, I hear a lot of women die in like back alley abortions he's like i made up women dying in back alley abortions actually that's me that was my thing turns out alleys jewish conspiracy who knew (laughs) (laughs) even though we just admitted that that's part of my backstory now i'm pretending it's not real yeah and they have this amazing moment where they try to apologize for the fact that they didn't make up the numbers even though they're saying they did it's like yeah we made up those numbers that said 50 percent of people support abortions and the girl in their movie about their lie goes, wait, haven't other people checked those numbers? And he's like, yeah, it's because <laughs> everyone believed our lie. And so exactly the same amount of people said yes. the thing as we made up. Right. Oh, Jesus. Christ. They literally end this scene toasting to how evil they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We also get the rabbi abortion referral here, a scene that is a hate crime in 12 states. Have <laughs> I got an abortionist for you? Oh, he's in. He's out. Don't you worry, Bubala. I'm going to Jewish the chala, okay? <laughs> they use every single Jewish word they could come up with during this mm-hmm. scene. They're just like, we're going to list our Jewish words. Yep. <laughs> it's so fucked up. So, okay, so meanwhile, though, the abortion Avengers sure are getting railroaded in this Supreme Court case. 
Yeah, <laughs> it's so unfair. <laughs> they get way more amicus briefs than they do. I don't like that Joey Lawrence agrees with me that it's amicus. That I was like, <laughs> I, 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 that bothered me too. I, 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 I've long been on Team Amicus, and I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> maybe, maybe, a maybe I, am I the baddie? Yeah. It, <laughs> oh, God. But seriously, the movie is saying, surely there must be some conspiracy theory angle as to why virtually nobody agrees with our legal position. Yes. Yep. Uh, that's that's what number like you can like I submit as as everybody on the show knows like opening arguments submitted an abacus brief right like there it was hard work but like it's not like a thing where you have to sign up on like a vaccine sheet or something right <laughs> you, you can go do that like you just have to like have a legal argument that you can articulate as to why the court should listen to you that screens out a lot of crazy people right but not but not all of them. <laughs> Also, this is another one of those times, like Noah was saying, they're doing a walk and talk in a giant protest scenario. Mm -hmm. and so they're, they're going through and it's this huge crowd and you watch this crowd be like, oh, sorry, you're doing a walk and talk with boom mics. We better spread out by like 30 feet to let go by <laughs> yes, and we watch this happen. It's so dumb. <laughs> Also, she wants to challenge Dr. Bernard Nathans into a doctor battle, we learn here. Yeah, right. Uh huh. But then the response to that is torts professor joey lawrence who says well i'll call all the da's across the country and we'll really get these people arrested yeah that is your hero of this yes movie. right so so how many levels is this fucking ridiculous this guy the good guy in the movie is like well let's arrest abortion doctors in the middle of abortions and also I'm a goddamn professor at Fordham. Why am I able to do this? <laughs> <laughs> On whose authority? Mostly, mostly free time. That's, yeah, that's right. He just brings his class with him to, to yeah. bust in on these things. I'm going to do some pro bono arrests. God damn it, Professor Joey. We Do we have to do class <laughs> outside again? I hope there's no buckets at this one. Because, yes, the most notorious thing leading up to this movie is that it has buckets of aborted fetus in it. We're about to get to that scene. This is the raiding the secret abortion clinics montage. <laughs> Jesus. The, the cop. Okay, we're going to talk about the buckets of dead babies, mm -hmm. but I would also like <laughs> to talk about the cop who punches the doctor in the middle of a medical yeah. procedure <laughs> and looks over at the woman, like expecting gratitude. And even the actress in the movie kind of looks at him like, Dude, you just punched no, out I my doctor be, in the middle of a medical I procedure. Would be very like, so fuck yourself. Yeah. Are you are you a really good surgeon in addition yeah. to a cop who can finish this up? Because uh. I'm, uh, you know, under surgery right now. Yes. Thanks. Jesus Christ. And and also, by the way, the movie that has made such a big deal out of how evil it is to point out that Catholics organize the anti-abortion movement or whatever says, you know, it's mostly the Jews and the Protestants that helped us with our secret abortion clinics. Pretty much, it was all Jews and. Protestants, so you know. Sorry, will you remind me which groups were behind this big conspiracy one more time? Will you just say it out loud one more time? Actually, actually, can we distract you with these buckets of fetus, perhaps? What the fuck? Yes. I'm like, man, now all you need is 11 herbs and spices. And <laughs> he, he punches the doctor and walks into like a back closet and there are literally steel <laughs> pails full, <laughs> again, overflowing with dead nine-year-olds. Yeah. <laughs> like props from Jaws. These were buckets of chum. Yeah. And it was, like, we might as well see fetuses flopping around like shrimp in a net. Like, it's so crazy. Sea <laughs> spiracy was like, okay, a little bit much on the chum <laughs> footage, people. Okay, and so, and then we get the scene with Dr. Mildred cooking with her mom, who is um, Alveda King, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this right. This is the MLK's niece. Yeah. In real life. Uh -huh. If you're wondering, you last saw her at the RNC endorsing Trump. So mm -hmm. you yes. know, if Diamond and Silk come out in the next scene, like, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> we're uh, gonna get okay. real close. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, though, when she drops the dish in horror and she just fucking spikes it into the ground like she's about to get a celebration penalty. <laughs> that was crazy. So they show the scene from Golden Girls where they talk about it. From, um, from Mod. According Mod. 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 Yeah, you're you're like 
20 years too early there, but yeah. Learn some B. Arthur history, assholes. <laughs> <laughs> Which, according to this movie, Nayral gave $10,000 for them to do. The Jews were behind Maud, too. Did yeah, you? yeah. Right. <laughs> The Jews were behind Maud. But as the scene is playing, Mildred's mom is supposed to drop her casserole dish in horror, except Althea King went to the Roger Stone School of Acting, so she just fucking slammed <laughs> his meatloaf into the floor. Also, Andrew, please tell me B. Arthur can sue for this, for being <sighs> even represented for a second on this screen in this movie. So probably not victoriously, but I, I, I will gladly be Arthur. If you're listening and, and I know you, <laughs> are, we know you are, <laughs> I will gladly represent you pro bono for misappropriation of likeness here just to conduct some discovery. Okay. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> you know, we're going to find some Russian shit if we do discovery on this oh movie. I mean, if nothing else, we'll get that Mike Landell footage that we're after. So. Again, worth it. Yeah. All right. So, and, and apparently in the middle of that episode of Maud, Nixon cuts in to nominate Powell and Rehnquist to the Supreme Court. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hello, it's me, Richard Nixon. My two judges are trustworthy and great guys. You can tell because I'm literally committing felonies as I get <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pro tip, if, if Richard Nixon is a good guy in your movie, <laughs> uh, stop. <laughs> Don't. Uh, uh, more, more, more filmmakers should take that advice. I, I just wanted to point out that we get the reaction shot in Alveda King's kitchen where like they've unfurled a U.S. flag behind them. They're standing. <laughs> yeah. They've got their hands over their hearts. They're, they're mouthing the words to the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> and, and what William Rehnquist is saying on the screen is not. I believe Plessy v. Ferguson was rightly decided, <laughs> which might have played slightly differently in that African-American household. I don't know. Jesus Christ. Uh. And then we get so we cut back over to the abortion Avengers meeting up again. Once again, there's an abortion protest happening all around them. And Joey Lawrence actually confronts the fact that the whole point of this, the whole point of the anti-abortion movement is to make everyone Christian. Or to at least force them to conform to Christian ethics. Yeah. Which is a weird thing for them to admit. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and instead of just being like, no, this is about protecting life. They're like, well, there's no rule in the Constitution that says we can't make everyone Christian. <laughs> yeah, right. No, he actually pulls the whole. Well, actually, that's a common mistake. There is nothing about separation of church and state in the Constitution. No. And I'm like, yeah, the fuck there is. I know that we have <laughs> yeah. Andrew here for this, but yes, the fuck there is. <laughs> yeah. Rehnquist thinks there's a separate but equal between church and state. <laughs> <laughs> I can't refute Joey Lawrence any better than yes, the fuck there is. But, you know, we really do get like a good solid three minutes of the Air Bud defense here, right? Yes. Yep. <laughs> oh, we get more than that. It keeps going. Yeah. For the rest oh, of the yeah, movie, we... they're like, where does it say you can murder a baby in the Constitution? <laughs> he literally says that at one point. Yeah, we'll get there. But meanwhile, Lincoln is sitting in his memorial very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> we get Justice Corbin Burnson wrestling with his conscience along with uh, newly minted Justice Rehnquist, who is not at all about this baby murdering stuff. Yeah, he's like, I don't know, Justice Rehnquist, can we do this to women's rights? And Justice Rehnquist is like, this has nothing to do with women's rights. Now allow me to say a sentence with the word rights right in it when I'm describing <laughs> this case. <laughs> but they do all of this shit before the arguments, right? For just to make it a little bit more, a little quicker before. No. They <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I realized. I realized that was, uh, you know, you were you were uh, lofting the, the ball over to me for that one. <laughs> but like, right. We just went through the whole thing about there's going to be re-argument like Supreme Court. This movie seems to like think that being on the Supreme Court, you got nothing but time. Right. Like, just, <laughs> well, we're going we're gonna to stroll around, you know. Let's wander around to some of the night more photogenic things here. In yeah. the Please grasp my elbow and we shall have a garden walk together. We'll stroll and we'll talk about how arguments don't matter that we just heard. I don't care. I'm Christian. I'm a 
Supreme Court. They're on a canoe together under a big umbrella. (laughs) It really is. So look, I went, I went to undergrad at GW and like we were assigned like, you know, 1990s camcorders in one of my, you know, filmmaking classes and like, Everybody who's a GW student then like goes right like the movies you make all of a sudden will have like all of the monuments in the background. Mm-hmm. Right? Like you, you just get to but like I didn't expect that to be a professional film. <laughs> to be like, oh, well, you know, we're here in DC, gotta gotta put the Jefferson in the background here. Like what what are you doing, you people? Well, I love the idea that like Supreme Court justices are just like, you know, I'm gonna hit up the Lincoln Memorial before I head yeah. home today. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, a lot of New Yorkers being like, let's stop at the top of the Empire State yeah, Building. I don't know we're here. You know? <laughs> so. I wonder what the Statue of Liberty might inspire if we discuss this next to her. God. <laughs> oh, so, okay, so, but then we now apparently all the unborn fetuses have a better lawyer. We meet the new better lawyer that they've assigned to this case. Yep. Now, real thing, it kind of fucks up the movie's narrative about how yep. the only reason they lost Roe v. Wade is because their side's lawyers were so bad because they get a better lawyer to come in. But spoiler, still lose. Oh, and and worse. Yeah. And what I love here is that they like they, they have this moment where they come in and Joey Lawrence is like, yeah, well, we've set up a, a mock trial here that we can go through. And then the Dallas DA is like, I don't need your bullshit mock trial. And the other lawyers like, actually, I feel like that'd be very helpful. And, yeah. and they're like, oh, OK, well, I guess we do need your mock trial then. Like, what was the point of that fucking scene? <laughs> well, they could have gone. So they could have had like a training montage with like feces and a chicken <laughs> coop and oh, Mickey oh, and man. Burgess <laughs> Meredith yelling at him to go grab. That could have been oh. amazing. Oh, yeah. if you if you cue, you, you know, playing uh, Robert Tepper's You're the Best through this. Oh, <laughs> it's spectacular. This is also where they touch on Robert Burns crazy moment where he tried to make himself dad of all unborn <laughs> yeah. children in New York State. An argument so stupid that. They didn't even bother making it during Roe versus Wade. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's it's just a side crazy thing that Robert Byrne did that they <laughs> needed to mention where Robert Byrne was like, I declare fatherhood. And they were like, no, Robert Byrne, you're not. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, like, as I'm sure you, you gathered, he intervened in a specific case. So he was very temporarily guardian ad litem for a class of unborn fetuses for this one particular hospital for like a week and a half. He was not guardian ad litem of the galaxy. Okay, (laughs) I got this pink green lantern ring from a fetus that died in a spaceship crash. Uh, (laughs) What if a fetus wants a better lawyer? How do we know? Like, I don't understand. (laughs) how. Just lawyer. picturing a fetus doing that, like he asked me to suck his dick monologue <laughs> when it went viral a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now, so now Bernie's complaining to Larry, right? Because he made himself an abortion clinic, but then New York changed their laws, and he's out of business, right? And they're and they're doing a walk and talk in the middle of an abortion protest as well. <laughs> <laughs> a different one. <laughs> okay. Yep. Guys, I have a very important question about this scene. (laughs) Did I black out or did they say that lady who loved abortion because she wanted to kill all the black people was against abortion? uh, So, yeah, again, one of these, it's your movie movie, but it is 100 percent true. Margaret Sanger opposed abortion and that Planned Parenthood. Remember that pin I told you put in like five scenes ago? didn't provide abortions until after Roe v. Wade. So remember all that like conflict of interest about like yeah. all these women that work at Planned Parenthood slash oh, volunteer wow. slash whatever. Yeah, like that yeah, is they, they giving were out completely contraception, unrelated. taking mammograms, working for women's health. Like, yeah, how this plays into the Margaret Sanger racist eugenicist don't give money to Planned Parenthood. I don't think they thought that one through very well. <laughs> it's because no. that was one of their main things. Yeah, yeah. They made us watch her speak in front of a flaming cross. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I didn't think they wanted to not alienate their pro flaming cross. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and, and there's a moment here too. So Larry, that's uh, Jamie Kennedy, is arguing with Betty about which of them owns the women's liberation movement. The, the, like he, he, he like spreads his arms out wide and literally says, look what I have created in the middle of this abortion protest. 
Like, what the hell is even <laughs> happening anymore? And and Betty Friedan randomly looks over her shoulder and shouts equality for no reason, like three <laughs> separate times. Yes. Like, oh, we got to keep throwing red meat to this uh, protest that we're sorkening in the middle of. Like, uh, it's so great. <laughs> it's the best. At one point, she's like, abortion is cheaper than child support. And nobody, like, calls back from the protest. Yeah. Like, I said abortion <laughs> is cheaper than child. You yell what I yell. And everybody's like, that. okay. I mean, you were just having like a normal walk and talk conversation. <laughs> you didn't even rhyme anything. Let's go, Mets. <laughs> oh, oh, God. So, okay. So we're not quite done with the terrible, stupid cameos yet. There's oh, one God. left, and it may be the worst one because this fucking idiot cannot stop smiling giddily at the idea of being on camera for one fucking second. But just as Corbin Burnson is having dinner with the family and his daughter is Tommy Laren. <laughs> <laughs> and she also went to the Roger Stone school of Ooh. looking not at the camera. <laughs> oh, man. She's so like you thought when you saw Roger Stone, you're like, well, it can't can't be worse than that. And then Albina King came in. And she's like, it could be. It could be. I just didn't have very many lines. And then Tommy shows up and makes Roger Stone look good. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it, this is a Supreme Court justice and his daughter is like, hey, uh, you know, we're all having dinner. You want some advice about Supreme Courting? I'll tell you what to decide in that upcoming case. <laughs> he's like, I'm not supposed to do that, but okay. Okay. And then the VO is like, and that's another justice who's in on the conspiracy. <laughs> well, and also it points out that his, his daughter volunteers at Planned Parenthood and then the voiceover cuts in and says, that's the second justice with a family member working for Planned Parenthood. And I'm like, again, volunteering. And again, no abortions yeah, right, in 1972. Exactly. But, and I don't want to bring us down, but like this movie's serious message again and again is, well, you know, like if these justices, you know, just didn't have stupid women in their lives, then yep. they could have made the rational decision here. But, yep. you know, they were led astray by their, you know, crazy uh, daughters and wives saying, <laughs> hey, maybe women are people. Well, um, there's, there's an actual line. There's an actual line. He's like, if I vote against women's rights, you're saying I'm voting against women? And the whole table of women is like, yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. Well, how yes. would that not be? You're stupid. How are you, you know, just I'm Tommy subtract. Laren and I can follow this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so to be super clear, the entire point of this scene, at least in the movie's mind, is that Justice Corbin Burnson had it right. He was going to do the right thing. But then he started listening to all them damn women. Right. So and then we cut to this weird fucking diner scene where all the Supreme Court justices seem to be swapping out in some mad hatarian dining <laughs> ritual is speed dating. They do a speed dating <laughs> round before every trial. Uh, and this is where we get another Air Bud defense. Yeah. Air yes, Bud argument. Exactly. He's like, where does the Bill of Rights say that you can kill a baby? Um, Andrew is the Bill of Rights an exhaustive list of all, <laughs> all the, the rights? rights? Is that how it works? Like, am I not allowed to eat cheese like an apple because it doesn't say I can eat cheese like an apple in the Bill of Rights? It says it's all the right. It's the Bill of Rights. That's but, where they all are. But but this is not just. This is both rights and conduct, right? Like this is this is would need to be the Bill of exhaustively listing the stuff you can do. Yeah, right. Exactly. Oh, it's not called that. You're saying it's not called that. Yeah, not. Not as far as I know, not yet. You can eat I mean. cheese oh. like an apple. You can eat an apple like an apple. Fuck, we're Jesus. only we're like seventy pages in. <laughs> this is long. We're just just talking about apples. shit you can eat. Like an apple. <laughs> There's a lot of other foods. Uh, wow. oh. What if they invent other foods after we make this list, guys? <laughs> only foods in existence in 1791 count. <laughs> Hold on, what if a dog starts playing basketball? Oh, okay, this is going to take forever. Okay. Good. We're getting into the real shit now. <laughs> oh, God. So, and I just want to point out that during the speed dating scene, Justice not hurting anybody claims that <laughs> if they decide that abortion is legal, that'll be at least as bad as the Dred Scott decision. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Andrew? Is that <laughs> uh, no, leave, leave me out of this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay, I love this so goddamn much. We fast forward to six months later, and we're back in the Supreme Court. But, like, six months later than what? 
Right? <laughs> we, we haven't established when it was since that episode of Maud. Yeah, and I had to look that up. <laughs> Six months after that conversation, I guess, at the diner. So we head back into court. Kelsey Grammer's daughter is throwing it down once again. Yep. And then we get, and I am assuming that these exchanges are actual Supreme Court exchanges. Maybe. Yeah, no, I don't think these, these, I, no, it's tough. It's tough to tell because your instinct is right here because they accidentally put some smart words into Sarah Weddington's mouth, right? When, mm-hmm. when heretofore everything has been like, <laughs> you know, uh, math class is tough Barbie, right? <laughs> <Bless>. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Okay, this is where Rehnquist was like, okay, so my question for you, lawyer, a fetus is a person. And she's like, was, is that a question? No. Or, <laughs> he's like, fetus person? And so this stuff is all revisionist nonsense, right? Like, and, and you've seen this thread, like, throughout as they're, like, critiquing the bad performances of the lawyers. But, like, the pro-life movement, because they are teeing up, right? Like, the next thing on their agenda after the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade is let's recognize the fetus as a person for purposes of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment, right? So they have to pretend that, like, that argument would have, oh, that would have been an obvious, like, knock mm-hmm. down, like, game winning argument, except everybody on our side took a whole bunch of stupid pills for 50 years and never argued it, as opposed to, yeah, if you tried to make that argument at any point in the last five decades, you would have been laughed out of court and then put into restraints because it's an insane <laughs> argument. <laughs> also, couldn't we point out that, like, women are definitely people, right? I, like, that's, <laughs> that's the principle. If the fetus is entitled to due process of law <laughs> from the moment of conception before you can deprive it of liberty, then what that means is we can get a guard an ad litem appointed for every pregnant woman in America to right. put their their movement to a vote. Right? <laughs> that means pregnant women are all kidnapping people. Yeah, correct. They're kidnapping. That is them. that is a hundred percent what that means. Well, and it would also mean you'd have to release all pregnant women from prison, right? Yeah, because so, you haven't tried the baby. <laughs> That's a really good point. Also, all of those fetuses are entitled to a trial of other fetuses. That's right. <laughs> Fetus judge, fetus lawyers, fetus jury. (laughs) So, no, I love they bring out this doctor to the Supreme Court arguments here. And and he's like, yeah, life begins at conception. And one of the justices is like, so are all the doctors in agreement with that? And he goes, no, Uh, no. no. I actually had to say it weird just so that (laughs) life begins at conception is technically true. Not. Not as it a person. Life <laughs> yeah. is a very carefully yeah, chosen yeah, word. Yeah, I did throughout <laughs> right. this entire movie. That's the word. They're like, well, but but is it alive? As if the pro-choice side is well, you know, fetuses are actually animatronics manufactured by <laughs> Disney. Like, <laughs> what, what do they think we believe? Right. The fucking the doctor's like, but unborn babies are a minority. The Supreme Court guys, you you guys love minority. <laughs> yes. This is where the good lawyer gives his big. Speech speech where he's like babies are a minority (laughs) the true silent minority (laughs) not like stacy dash (laughs) i was just picturing this adorable version of the selma march here and i was like okay (laughs) i get it i'm gonna be a man sign i had the same like a non-uppity minority right like that was the clear implication (laughs) okay why did the movie get the evilest looking actor ever to be the pro-life attorney here. Right? <laughs> that guy was terrible. He looked like a trophy hunter at a prom and he's supposed <laughs> to be the good guy for them. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <sighs> okay, so, but that's the end of the arguments, or at least as much as we're going to get of that. Then we cut to Walter Conkite. He's going to tell us how the Skoda swung on this one. And what I love about this is, okay, so all the characters are watching this in dead silence, but they use the real news footage so yeah. <laughs> the opening is just a long list of all the reporters that are going to appear on that night's program and unrelated stories <laughs> that they're going to cover. And it goes on for so long. They don't tell you the answer. It was like, can we kill babies and how that affects your weekend? But first, yeah, gas prices are up. <laughs> We're talk about that. Also, I just want to point out, this is 1973. The Supreme Court announces its opinion starting at 10 in the morning, right? So the way in which this would have played out in real life is 
you would have gotten the decision first. You would have then read about it in the afternoon newspaper second. And then Walter Cronkite distant third. Right. Right. Like, yeah, exactly. Well, right. But they wanted it to be cinematic for this for this moment. So, yeah. But now, because the movie is unaware that it's fucking over, Joey Lawrence and another things us from his classroom for a good five minutes. <laughs> and everybody get everybody get back in my class. I have more shitty arguments <laughs> for my movie. <laughs> hey, hey, the runtime on this movie was long enough. Like, I looked down and I was like, how is there still 18 more minutes of runtime? Right. Okay. If you kill a pregnant lady, that's two people. Oh, also, Jesus oh. fucking Christ. He, at one point, he's arguing with one of the students and he turns to a student and he opens his hypothetical with, I'm not kidding. If I murdered you, <laughs> never open your hypothetical with that unless you fucking mean it, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> you sound just like Andrew yelling at me about my notes for this podcast. <laughs> And again, the movie is so close to being self-aware, right? Because because he's starting to like set up this hypothetical and it's like, yeah, so right, if if I murdered you and you were pregnant, should they charge me with one murder or two murders? And she says, uh, two murders. And, and he's like, right, because if someone took away your choice to give birth, oh, fuck, I'll come in again. Damn right. It. Right. Oh. right, but what's even better than that is that the students, like, as though the extras are, like, more aware than the screenwriter, are like, well, you're the law professor, we wouldn't know. Right. right? <laughs> so she's just like, I don't fucking know, man. And then he's going, like, the courts won't grant personhood to unborn babies, but they'll grant it if you're the fucking Sierra Club to trees and rivers and uh, fish and shit, because they get uh, lawyers. Right. <laughs> this is the best. <laughs> hey, Andrew. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> trees and corporations are people, right? That's, this is, that's the last one, right? So, so Keith, <laughs> Keith makes Keith makes by far the best point here, which is it's lo- it's real weird, you know, for this movie to be like t- <laughs> trees, trees can have standing, right? Like, yeah, you know, corporations have deeply oh, and sincerely a- held <laughs> religious beliefs, <laughs> right, but you know, yes. a, a tree, <laughs> what, the, what the fuck even is that? Right? Uh, <laughs> but here's here's what we're talking about. Okay, we're talking about. A dissent, okay, and again, dissent side that did not win. That's the losing team, <laughs> yeah. right? This yeah. is right. not law. Written by Justice Douglas, in which he he argued, and it, it, it is it's a pretty famous dissent, and it does like what Supreme Court dissents are supposed to do, which is raises an important philosophical question, right? And so this was uh, the Sierra Club case was an environmental case that was tossed out because no party had sufficiently alleged standing, right? And the court was like, yeah, well, we're not going to render an advisory opinion about, you know, like lighting stuff on fire or whatever. And Douglas very sensibly says, well, you know, we do this all the time in like asset forfeiture cases, right? And you've seen these like headlines on, you know, that, that make the round on Twitter and in memes of like, you know, United States versus 8,376 pounds of decomposing paddlefish meat. Or right. Whatever, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so if we can have that kind of fiction, right? If paddlefish meat can, can have standing, then maybe like the property itself that is the subject of environmental regulations ought to have standing in these cases as well. It is a perfectly sensible argument. And the idea that it's being deployed here is like, yeah, that crazy William O. Douglas, like he thought a tree was a person, but a baby isn't. I, go fuck yourself. I was, I'm, I'm real. Well, okay. I'm, yeah. All right. You're not impressed with that argument. How about this one that, that Joey throws out at us? Someone read me the constitutional amendment that allows mothers to murder their babies. <laughs> That's literally the line. I wrote in my notes at this point. What? Fucking class is this? <laughs> Criminal procedure. Remember. Yeah. Also, the Constitution doesn't say we have a right to privacy. Hot day. <laughs> it also doesn't say that he can eat cheese like an apple. Let me let me read I'm, your phone. I'm doing test, Andrew. Test case. We got this. So, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna the guy. Like, so, so I gotta I gotta do thirty seconds on this. The constitutional right to privacy means something a little different than like what you and I think of like, hey, don't read my text messages on my phone, right? Like the constitutional right to privacy is the thing that gets parodied all the time of like, yeah, what's a penumbra, right? But but it's a super important concept that says there are core basic rights like 
whom to marry and whether or not to have a child that are implicit in the concept of ordered liberty protected by the Bill of Rights. They're not specified, spelled out, written in words that Joey Lawrence can read, but they're <laughs> essential to what understanding our history as a free nation. And if you think there is no right to privacy in the Constitution, then what you must think, because these two cases were both based on it, is that states can prohibit selling contraceptives which was Griswold versus Connecticut. They would not sell you contraceptives unless you could produce a marriage certificate. Jesus Christ. And that loving versus Virginia, right. which struck down Virginia's laws preventing miscegenation was wrongfully decided. So in other words, that states could go back and decide not to sell contraceptives and to prohibit the mixing of the races. Great. If you can explain that, right, then like, Maybe we shouldn't be like yucking it up with uh, Joey Lawrence going like, I don't see the word privacy anywhere in the Constitution. You know what else might make you uh, intellectually consistent there is agreeing with Plessy v. Ferguson and the Dred Scott. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. right. Uh, well, so and, and then the, his final argument, just to point out how stupid this is, because they're saying, well, a fetus isn't a person. He's like, but if a fetus is left in nature, it becomes a person. I'm like, no, it, no, it, it would just die. If you just left it out in the woods, it would just die. A fetus becomes a person, so come is murder? Right. <laughs> or it would become like a wolf. If it could be a wolf. By, you, I mean, like, you never know. It's going to erase it once it's out there. He's just standing outside of a women's bathroom. He hears someone use the tampon dispenser. Murderer! <laughs> and now, and now, finally, you've been waiting for it the whole movie. Dr. Bernie and Dr. Mildred are going to face off right in front of a fucking maternity ward. Ridiculous. <laughs> and this this scene is so fucking fantastic. They didn't even let her win. No. <laughs> no. She's like, excuse me, doctor. How do you sleep at night? And he's like, fine, I help women. And she's like, no. <laughs> well, so so what she said is, you know, even a safe abortion can make a woman sterile. And I'm like, a root canal can fucking kill you. Yeah. Okay. Right. Like, that's not, an, or that's not like that by itself is not an argument remotely against abortion. Yeah. Also, isn't sterility like not in the top 10 of, you know, like it, it decreasing order of potential complications. It's like, you know, point zero 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 one percent. Yeah. Okay. Right. But that's the thing. It's not a meaningful statement until you put a statistic next to it. Right. Like the likelihood of that happening matters. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Bernie turns to her and goes, I feel nothing. Fuck those little fetuses. I killed my <laughs> own fetus. I killed my own fetus and I talked shit to it the whole time. <laughs> Actually, do you want to watch in this doodly do with yeah, these we have a, I brought a I brought a tape. I brought a clip. <laughs> we literally watch that happen. It's very upsetting. And the and the nurse is standing there the whole time while he's doing it, going, Don't do it, Doctor Abortion. It's your own baby. <laughs> I love no. as he's telling this fucking story, somewhere in the background, someone flatlines for effect. <laughs> they run the flatlines. I'm like, that means death, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just want to cut over to just some dude being a smart ass. He's like, no, I'll plug it back in. I'm sorry. I just wanted to, because you were telling the story about killing your kid. I thought it would be funny if I pulled my thing out just then. But yeah. Sorry, there. that's my ringtone. I got to <laughs> bring this to the hospital with me. <laughs> it's, it's a little goof I like to play on the nurses. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So and then, oh, my God. So we, we haven't really focused on this. Dr. Nathanson is played by Nick Loeb, the, the guy who wrote and <laughs> eventually wound up directing <laughs> through no fault of his own this movie. So he's he's the writer, director and star. And this is the first time in the movie that he's really given himself some heavy acting to do. Oh, yeah. This is the scene where Dr. Abortion walks through the church asking God what the fuck's up with abortion? <laughs> okay. Question, Eli. If you started to have second thoughts about, like, maybe the atheism thing was a mistake, um, would you go to a Catholic church to argue? St. <laughs> Patrick's Cathedral. Absolutely. St. Patrick's Cathedral. Yeah, stop. Absolutely. I go there just to mess with people. I walk in in the middle of a quiet part of mass and I just go, you let me fuck all those mayonnaise jars and yet you stand there. And it gets a good laugh. Let me tell you. 
<laughs> it does. Or you come in blacked up during Ash Wednesday and you tell them that you really you want a refund. It's like, I have a whole bunch of St. Patrick's Day Cathedral pranks I can list on our podcast. But he's just he's acting his whole his little heart out. You you wouldn't know if you just walked in and seen cold or oh, whatever. Oh, it's adorable. Oh, this guy definitely saw Jed Bartlett doing this in West Wing with smoking <laughs> a cigarette and stubbing it out in the middle of the, the big Catholic church. And he tried to do No, it does not work. Oh, out. it's fucking rough. He's a lot like Martin Sheen as an actor, but he doesn't, he doesn't quite pull off this scene. <laughs> yeah. All right. So then we cut to the future and Dr. Abortion is, is learning about them newfangled ultrasound machines because he's about to have his turn. See, Turns out he can't perform an abortion when he has to look that little fetus in the eye. <laughs> uh, well, what we call what he sees on the ultrasound of fetus? <laughs> a a, a, a six-year-old? Yeah, yeah, it's a right. video of my son is what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fucking bouncing around on a squishmallow and he's like, you're telling me that's a one-week-old baby? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, wow. Yeah, they invent the ultrasound and then they show us him with his ultrasound. And I was like, oh, my God, are they going to show us like the quartering happening with the <laughs> ultrasound? And yes, they yep. fucking do. Yep. They show us that. Yep. And we get and we get the dumbest. We get a scream from the fetus. Right. Mm hmm. A like like a snake demon screaming. <laughs> they're like the Ghostbusters trap was getting it. <laughs> 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 His argument is like, oh, I never saw him before. Yes, you did, man. Yeah. You took him out. You gave a speech earlier in the movie about how you had to put him back together as a puzzle. Yeah. Like, you've seen <laughs> fetuses. Right. Is there something about the location that really did it for you, bucko? Yes. I need it on a 1970s oscilloscope for me to form an emotional <laughs> yeah. connection. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but so, okay, so then now it's 12 years later. We cut back to that WAPO interview that we opened on. And he's that this is where like he got caught in his abortion lie, except he already, like we said, already had his turn, so that made no goddamn sense. Straw 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 poll, did did anyone need this loose end cleaned up? I'm just I'm like <laughs> Yeah, this, Jesus this is a weird this is a weird one to add another five minutes of the movie on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. No, it, it, but but again, so and and to show you how bad they are at making their argument, the close is him saying, Yep. I was a lying liar who unapologetically lied to murder babies. Lie, lie, lie. But now you can trust me. Now you can trust me. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, again, just in case you were ever going to take any second of this seriously, we go back to his killing his own baby doodly do, and his glasses are too foggy for him to see what he's doing. <laughs> he finally clears his glasses and looks at what he's done. Oh, God. And the cut up fetus, which we're supposed to be like, <gasps> is the funniest thing that has, it's, first of all, it's a Stretch Armstrong doll. Yep. Second of all, it's way too big. It's 9,000 pounds. <laughs> it's so big and stupid. I like, honestly, like, I thought that part, because I knew that part was coming. It's one of the more controversial parts of the movie. I thought it was really fucking gross me out. And then I saw it and I'm like, oh, that's actually pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> It's four dicks arranged in a stick figure. <laughs> oh, it's it honestly it looked like the beginning of some, you know, Tim Burton musical thing or something. So and then we get a few statistics to close out on. Sixty one million babies have been aborted since Roe v. Wade, so nailing it. Good job, guys. <laughs> yeah, we're crushing it. African American women account for almost forty percent, so it's pr probably helping with racial inequality quite a bit. Not sure what point they thought they just made. Every 30 seconds, a baby is aborted in the U.S., in case you hadn't been doing the math. And also, Mother Teresa sent a letter to Congress telling them that abortion is bad. Hey, right. remember the Nixon rule from before? <laughs> <laughs> Mother Teresa shouldn't be your good guy either. And then we get the abortion song reprise. Oh. <laughs> the well, they also they also try and show us their sources here. They're like, Margaret Sanger did go to a women's branch of the KKK. And it's like, excerpt from her book. I went to a place. Good. Excellent. Great. <laughs> well, right, right, right. So, and I have to ask, like, if she was such a raging bigot, like you say, why is that the worst quote you could come up with from her? Yeah, why did yeah. she marry a Jew? <laughs> <laughs> 
But the best part of their fact check section at the very end here is the Larry Nadler thing, right? Because they have spent this entire movie being like, I'm Larry Nadler. I love fetus juice and I love to fuck. And I control the media. Yeah. (laughs) And it's just a clip of Larry Nadler being like, the Catholics break the law. And they're like, see, see, he hated us. He hated us the whole time. Yep. And as though this movie felt like it had not yet been disingenuous enough, it shows us a clip of Norma McCorvey. Now, so here's the thing, just to be clear, Norma McCorvey, and she has admitted exactly this in the years leading up to her death, was paid by pro-lifers to pretend to have switched sides and she took the money. Yeah, She felt terrible about having done it, but it was something she was paid to do. They knew that when they made this fucking movie. Mm-hmm. Right? She didn't admit this after that movie was made. But they play it like, look, we've got the live footage here of an undercover cop getting her to admit that she was against abortion all along. Right. And they and they come back to that whole like and those lawyers lied to me. They said they didn't know where I could get an abortion. And it's like, man, your lawyer's not going to hook you up with an illegal abortion. Trust me, I've asked Andrew about this (laughs) several times. Yeah, they they seem very unclear on what the job of a lawyer is (laughs) in this movie. (laughs) I I loved on the denouement. My favorite was we we get to see Bernie become a completed Jew. Oh, yes. yes. Right. It is a lengthy, like he's kneeling down and <laughs> getting baptized. And I, oh, my God. Yep. It's- I used to be an atheist Jew, but then I stopped loving killing babies. Yep. Uh, he even goes like he, his voiceover comes up and he's like, I also produced a documentary called The Silent Scream, which is largely considered one of the most disingenuous pieces of propaganda ever produced in English. Noah will probably have to watch that shit eventually, too. <laughs> the end. Yeah. I call I call not in on that one. <laughs> I made a short film so dishonest that all the doctors got together to condemn it. Just a movie. That's crazy yeah. that the doctors got together to be like, fuck that guy. All right. Well, I, and that's where the movie ends. Thank God it's over. And Andrew, your expertise is always appreciated as is your wit. Never more so than on this movie. There was so much research that I didn't have to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, I think. Um, and, and of course, not that our audience doesn't already know, but could you give them a reminder real quick where they can go to hear more from you? Yeah. Opening arguments. Uh, go ahead. Type it in. Or my new show, Clean Up on Aisle 45, which is about uh, surviving in post-Trump's America and uh, reforming the Department of Justice. Um, there. And it's an it's an awesome show. It's all the questions that you didn't realize you quite had just yet. Yeah. So, and, and OK, so, Andrew, thank you again so much for your help. Absolutely. <laughs> and well, that does it for our review of Roe v. Wade. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to carry on another episode to term next week. So, Eli, tell us. What's on deck? When a guitar player must use his power of guitar playing to defeat Satan, we're going to watch that shit. We'll be watching Laser Us. Oh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> like Lazarus. <laughs> wow, now he wow. spoiled it, but... Um, it's such a good title. All right. So, yeah, we needed that. This is a little little more lighthearted next week. So we're about to look forward to it. We're going to bring episode 295 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Andrew Torres and a perhaps even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving us a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scaling Idiot Citation Needed, D&D Minus, and The Skeptic Crowd, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email God off of at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slot to be on Mars. All of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clerk, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a check your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm No Illusions. Promise to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club clothes. This movie just came out, so we don't have numbers about the revenue yet, but Unplanned, that we also reviewed, made about $15 million in profit. So, yes, there's a fortune in abortion, just like that <laughs> terrible fucking jingle. Abortion went on to radically lower the crime rate. <laughs> it did. Jamie Kennedy still hasn't killed himself, and therefore, neither can anybody else. 
The Supreme Court is going to reverse Roe v. Wade, and there isn't a goddamn thing you or I can do. Don't do that. (sighs) I mean, there are things. Oh. (laughs) Oh, Morgan, it's going to be a long one. (laughs) (laughs) I feel so bad for Morgan because we've done, like, I think whatever, like, Three of the last five have been so low. We did Justice League, and when then we did, we had the what's what's his name and what's his name on, and they went so long. And then there, was, there had been that really long one with Kara right before that. So yeah, and and now this one's going to be probably pretty long, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not Snyder cut. So. No, exactly. <laughs> it's the oh. Schne- it's the Schneider cut. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Heath. Thank you. I, I, it wasn't it wasn't the best pun in the world, but it wasn't hurting anybody. I mean, <laughs> and interstitial too. I I bet that's that's probably like a, 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 a legal prophylactic. That skin is. I, like. <laughs> All right. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like I'm fucking so, counting on it. So do, so do I. Because yeah. <laughs> I don't have a lot of information about the Supreme Court for this review. <laughs> All right, here we go. Interstitial (laughs) 2. Are you sure you don't want to go back, do that again, and give it a a real Jewy voice like you do? Like, uh, like, like, channel your inner Jamie Kennedy. (laughs) uh, Oh, don't kill yourself. (sighs) Channel your inner Jamie Kennedy. Make up your mind, no illusions. Can I I change my vote on the bleach thing? Yes. (laughs) Uh. All right, Interstitial 3. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.